Inspiration, your ultimate calling. Introduction. I love being inspired, and I trust that the idea of living an inspired life appeals to you as well. I've written this book with the paramount idea of showing you what I've learned about this magical concept. This is the most personal book I've written in my 35 years as an author. I've chosen to use examples from my own life, that is, those I've experienced firsthand. The personal nature of this book is a deliberate choice. I discovered as I went along that in order to write about such a deeply felt subject as inspiration, I needed to convey what I felt as authentically as possible. Just as one can never actually know what a mango tastes like from another person's description, I wouldn't have been able to adequately convey my familiarity with the experiences of inspiration by citing case studies of others. By writing from my heart and speaking from my heart, I've been able to keep the flavor of inspiration alive here in this program. By the way, if you're interested in why I appear on the cover of this program looking blissfully at a butterfly, you'll find out in the final chapter how life looks when I'm inspired. As I was finishing this work, I had an incredible mystical encounter with one of God's most fragile creations. In the last chapter, I've described that astonishing experience, along with what your life might begin to look like, if you apply the insights offered throughout inspiration. I'm also well aware that I've repeated one theme over and over throughout this work. I decided not to edit out this repetition because I see this program as an instrument for moving you to a place where you truly understand what it means to be in spirit. This oft-repeated theme is live in spirit. You came from spirit, and to be inspired, you must become more like where you came from. You must live so as to become more like God. One of my favorite mentors and storytellers, Anthony DeMello, was a Catholic priest who lived in India and could convert complex philosophical issues into understandable and simple teachings using the art of storytelling. Here's one of those short tales from a book called The Heart of the Enlightened, in which Father DeMello does such a good job of summing up much of what I want to convey to you about living in spirit here in this program. Quote, the devotee knelt to be initiated into discipleship. The guru whispered the sacred mantra into his ear, warning him not to reveal it to anyone. What will happen if I do, asked the devotee. The guru responded, Anyone you reveal the mantra to will be liberated from the bondage of ignorance and suffering. But you, you yourself, will be excluded from discipleship and suffer damnation. No sooner had he heard those words than the devotee rushed to the marketplace, collected a large crowd around him, and repeated the sacred mantra for all to hear. The disciples later reported this to the guru and demanded that the man be expelled from the monastery for his disobedience. But the guru smiled and said, He has no need of anything I can teach. His action has shown him to be a guru in his own right. I trust that the meaning of this story will become clearer and clearer as you immerse yourself in this program. You have a profound calling back to spirit. It is working right now in your life. Otherwise, you wouldn't be listening to these words in this very instant. I urge you to heed that calling and come to know the pure bliss that awaits you as you make an inspired life your reality. In spirit, that's me, Wayne Dyer. Part 1. Inspiration. Living in Spirit. Chapter 1. Living Your Life in Spirit. When you are inspired, dormant forces, faculties, and talents come alive, and you discover yourself to be a greater person by far than you ever dreamed yourself to be. That's a quote from Patanjali. In the title of this book, I've deliberately used the word calling to indicate the importance of inspiration as it applies to our lives. There's a voice in the universe entreating us to remember our purpose, our reason for being here now in this world of impermanence. The voice whispers, 
shouts and sings to us that this experience, this experience of being in form, in space and time, has meaning. That voice belongs to inspiration, which is within each and every one of us. Inspiration responds to our attentiveness in various and sometimes unexpected ways. For example, when I began writing this book, I debated between the two titles, Inspiration, Your Ultimate Destiny, or Inspiration, Your Ultimate Calling. One day, while I was swimming in the ocean, I was going back and forth in my mind, trying out both titles. Still uncertain, when I'd finished my swim, I called Reed Tracy, who's the president and CEO of my publishing company at Hay House, from a payphone to get his opinion about the title. While I waited for him to answer, the word calling appeared on the miniature screen of the telephone. Nothing else, just calling. And then the word began to flash on and off as if it were trying to get my attention. When Reed answered, I told him what had just occurred, and we both agreed on inspiration, your ultimate calling for the title of this book and this program. All of this may appear to be nothing more than a silly coincidence, but I know better. We know that there's something deep within us waiting to be known, which we sometimes call a gut reaction to life's events. We have a built-in yearning to seek our inspired self and feel wholeness, a kind of inexplicable sense that patiently demands recognition and action. We might describe it as a mechanism persistently projecting the words destiny or mission or purpose on our inner screen. It's possible to have our daily behavior so aligned with these inner feelings that we unequivocally know what our calling is. In fact, if you pause the recording and check it with what you're feeling at this very moment, my guess is that you'll hear a part of yourself crying out, yes, I want to have more inspiration in my life. I want to know my calling. I think of the word inspiration as meaning being in spirit. When we're in spirit, we're inspired. And when we're inspired, it's because we're back in spirit, fully awake to spirit within us. Being inspired is an experience of joy. We feel completely connected to our source and totally on purpose. Our creative juices flow and we bring exceptionally high energy to our daily life. We're not judging others or ourselves. We're uncritical and unbothered by behaviors or attitudes that in uninspired moments are frustrating. Our heart sings in appreciation for every breath, and we're tolerant, joyful, and loving. Being in spirit isn't necessarily restricted to the work we do or the activities of our daily life. We can be inspired and at the same time be unsure of what vocation to pursue or what activities we want to schedule. Inspiration is a simple recognition of spirit within ourselves. It's a return to that invisible, formless field from which all things emanate, a field of energy that I call intention in my previous book, The Power of Intention. In this program, I'm going beyond an understanding of the inherent power of intention, however, by describing how to live in spirit and hear the voice of inspiration even when we're doing absolutely nothing that we'd call purposeful. This is quite different from being highly motivated. In fact, it's almost the opposite of motivation. My experience with being in spirit. When I'm in spirit, I have a feeling of contentment, but more than this, I experience joy. I'm able to receive the vibrational energies of my source, call them voices or messages or silent reminders, even invisible suggestions or what have you, but they're vibrations of energy that I'm able to align with as I get myself out of the way. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, one of the world's great geniuses, once remarked, quote, When I am, as it were, completely myself, entirely alone and of good cheer, say, traveling in a carriage or walking after a good meal or during the night when I cannot sleep, it is on such occasions that my ideas flow best and most abundantly. Whence and how they come, I know not, nor can I foresee them. End of quote. We don't have to be a genius to know what Mozart speaks of. The same force in a different way is flowing through you and me right now. I've learned to remove resistance to the free flow of this spiritual energy by reminding myself to align with it or to be in spirit in my thoughts and my expectations. When I sit down to write, my desire is to invite spirit to express through me, and I encourage ideas to flow freely like, like Mozart. I'm connected as if it were to my source in spirit, thinking and expecting to be the instrument of my spiritual source. Ideas flow, and whatever assistance I need just shows up. 
And, like Mozart, I can't describe how the ideas come, and I can't force them. Staying in spirit seems to be the secret to this feeling of being inspired. I also find that inspiration flows in other areas of my life when my primary mission is like what Michael Berg so beautifully describes in Becoming Like God, Kabbalah, and Our Ultimate Destiny. Quote, Just as every being is God's business, every being becomes our business as well. Unquote. That is, being inspired necessitates the willingness to suspend ego and enter a space where I want to share who I am and what I have in a completely unlimited fashion. At a recent lecture, for instance, a woman named Rolina Di Silva approached me at the break to ask if I'd visited her teenage daughter, Allison, in the hospital for sick children in Toronto, Ontario. Allison had been hospitalized for many, many months due to a rare disease that's characterized by a breakdown of the lymphatic system. Her intestines had been perforated, so she was unable to process proteins and fats, and her prognosis was dismal at best. As I sat with Allison on my third visit with her, I held her hand and noticed that a scab was forming on the top of her hand from a minor injury brought about by an intravenous injection. Something came over me in that moment, and I looked into the girl's eyes and reminded her that the scab was a gift to her. It indicated that the essence of well-being, our source, was working within her. I reminded her that all she had to do was to summon that same well-being to her abdomen. You're already connected to spirit, I almost shouted. Otherwise, you wouldn't be growing a scab over that cut on your hand. When I spoke with Rolina 14 months later, I asked if she remembered that day in the hospital when I held Allison's hand and felt inspired by the scab. Rolina replied that that day was a new beginning for her daughter as something inside of her opened up. Always before, she'd had a blank look on her face, yet she gave off an air of intolerance about the entire process. When the girl realized that she was indeed connected to spirit, evidenced by the presence of the scab forming on her hand, she changed her attitude completely. Today, Allison is back home and actually doing work to raise money for that same hospital where she spent so many months as a critical care patient. If you ever see me speaking on television or in person, you'll notice a little angel pin that I wear, which was given to me by Allison as a thank you gift. To me, this pin is a symbol of the angel that guided me that day to speak to Allison as I did. I know in my heart that when we remember we're always connected to this source and that we can summon the well-being of God, it is then that we're said to be inspired. Whether the outcome is miraculous, as was Allison's, or our physical reconnection to our source is completed through the death of our body, we live out our moment in spirit. It's important to understand that each and every one of us represents God or spirit, revealing itself here and now on our planet. So in what direction are you moving? Being in spirit is a direction we take rather than a destination to be reached. Living our life in spirit requires us to determine that direction, and we do so by noticing our thoughts and our behaviors. Thoughts that are in spirit reflect a vibrational alignment moving us toward our ultimate calling. And obviously, this is the direction we want to take. Once we begin to observe our thoughts, we realize that there are many times we're going in the opposite direction. When we catch ourselves with conscious effort, we can make a U-turn with new thoughts. For example, blaming something we call evil is thinking in the wrong direction. When we see things in our world that we label evil, what we're really seeing are people moving away from their source, not individuals in the grip of an evil power. To become inspired on a daily basis, we must be able to quickly identify any thoughts that are moving us away from our source and then shift the direction. We need to bring love to the presence of hatred, as St. Francis advised. When we're consumed with thoughts we've labeled as evil, we need to notice that we're headed in the wrong direction. It's difficult to comprehend because we're accustomed to blaming our problems on external forces, such as evil or hatred, but we know better. We can make that U-turn by using the same energy within us that has us traveling away from God. Evil, hatred, fear, and even illness soften with love and kindness when we're in spirit. When we make that U-turn, we make an alignment correction and move back into the space of spirit in our thoughts and actions. A Course in Miracles quotes Jesus as saying, If you want to be like me, I will help you, knowing that we are alike. 
If you want to be different, I will wait until you change your mind. Being inspired is truly being like your source. If you're not, then your source is politely waiting for you to do something as simple as change your mind. Chapter 2 Your Life Before Your Birth Into a Body All bodies emerge from the soul and return to it. The visible emerges from the invisible, is controlled by it, and returns to it. That's a quotation from Lau Russell. This is clearly a purposeful universe with an intelligence supporting its creation and continuing evolution. And we're pieces of that intelligence by virtue of having emerged from it. Consider, for example, that scientific analysis of even a droplet of blood reveals all of the characteristics in our entire body's supply. The percentage of iron in that droplet is proportionately the same as in that which flows through our entire body. So it's easy to agree that the drop of blood is identical to the source from which it was removed. Now think about what happens to that droplet of blood when it remains in the state of separation. It can't fortify or heal us, and it can't circulate freely. Disconnected from its source long enough, it will simply dry up, decay, and disintegrate, even though it contains all of the physical properties necessary to survive that its original source does. I believe that our transition from spiritual source to physical beings made up of particles is similar to that bit of blood in that we contain all of the same properties as our source. But unlike that droplet, we're never completely separated from our source. I know that there are no accidents in a universe directed by a source energy that creates endless real magic in the form of its creations. I know that we agree to move from the world of spirit into the world of particles and form, to come forth at the exact time that we did, and to leave when we've agreed to do so. I also know that we decided to bring joyful perfection to this world and to share that godlike energy with everyone we encounter here on earth. It's our nature to do so. Our life, before becoming an embodiment of spirit, was exactly like our source. Then we began the transition process and became a tiny fetus intended to spend nine months developing in our mother's womb. I contend that we've chosen to enter this world of particles and form. In ways that we don't readily comprehend now, we knew what we were coming here to accomplish, and we participated in setting this life process in motion. Why place the responsibility or blame on anyone or anything that's not a part of us? On Earth, we've been given the gift of volition, that is, we can choose. So let's assume that we had the same capacity when we resided exclusively in the spiritual realm. We chose our physical body, just as we chose the parents we needed for the trip. And it doesn't seem too great a stretch to believe that we chose this life in concert with our source. The very first particle of human protoplasm intended to be ourself wasn't the architect of our physical being. Instead, it was an aspect of an invisible, formless energy field that was our self manifesting. In the particle and the energy field from which it emanated, with the size and shape of our eyes, our legs, our mouth, and so on. So it feels intuitively natural to me to assume that in that field of energy, the very shape of our life was also encapsulated. You see, deep within us lies an awareness of what shape our life is to take. We can hear that voice, the one that wants us to know our calling if we choose. But first, we need to surrender to that divine plan we signed up even before our conception. Our first nine months in form. Let's take a moment to go back to what took place from the very first moment of your manifestation into a particle, right up until you emerged from your mother's womb. Your embryo became a fetus in a space of total faith and cooperation. It had no demands, since it was simply carried along by the divine forces of nature. The basics of your development occurred without your interference. Your brain developed independent of your ideas about how it should be done. Your heart, liver, kidneys, toes, fingers, eyebrows, and every other feature appeared on a schedule that seems miraculous from this side of the womb, 
For most of us, it was nine months in the hands of the source of life inside a woman's womb, who may or may not have been cooperating and welcoming our existence. Whatever energy we needed to grow into that being that we signed up to be flowed directly to and through us. This is true for you, this is true for me, for all of us. How could we have gotten along so well in those first nine months with only the cooperation of our mother allowing us to develop inside? How could everything we required for the beginning of our human journey be so perfectly aligned with the creative spirit? The seed that we came from was so tiny that millions of them could fit on the head of a pin, and it looked identical to the seed that brings a giraffe, a palm tree, or any other living organism into the world of form. So how did it eventually become you or me? The seed materialized into what we intended to become under the auspices of the creative intelligence, and it flourished with the assistance of that remarkable spirit that's responsible for all of life. The entire process of creation simply unfolded. During those months that we lived in the womb, it's safe to say that we were in spirit. We were allowing spirit to perfectly align without any effort on our part. We were provided for entirely by a life force that none of us can completely describe or explain. We were a little larvae-shaped ooze ball that, in a relatively short period of time, became a human being with the apparatus necessary to support life outside of the womb. We can see that there's a force in the universe that's 100% trustworthy, one that we relied upon to get us here. It creates and manifests from a spirit of love, cooperation, beauty, and expansiveness, and it's to this flawless work of spirit that we can return in order to know inspiration. Throughout our life, we continue our development outside of the womb, wherein we rely on the energy of creation to fuel the light of inspiration within us. Now I'd like to share a conversation I was privileged to have with my originating spirit. This is an exercise that anyone can do in their imagination. My imaginary conversation with my spirit before manifesting into a physical particle. Being in a universe that's created and guided by an organizing intelligence that precludes accidents and coincidences, I've always felt that my presence here at this time is a component of that intelligent system. In a powerful experience of hypnosis, I recreated a conversation between my highest spiritual self and my originating source to which I'm still connected. This one imaginary exchange has been exceedingly helpful to me for the major portion of my adult life. I was conceived on the first day of September in 1939 and born on the 10th day of May in 1940. The day of my conception was the exact same day that Adolf Hitler invaded Poland. Two days later, World War II was initiated. I was born on the same day that the Nazis invaded and occupied Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg, and I saw the Holocaust coming. I knew that I was to play a dominant role in reversing the kind of hatred that precipitated the horrendous actions that resulted in the slaughter of millions and millions of people. I came here to teach self-reliance and compassion, just as in an earlier incarnation in the 13th century, when I wandered through Europe and Asia with or as Francesco Bernadone, who later became St. Francis of Assisi, attempting to stop the vicious activities known as the Crusades. My infinite soul was and still is tormented by human beings in humanity to their fellow humans and wants to eradicate suffering caused by separating ourselves collectively and individually and using violence to settle disputes. The answer, it seems to me, is to teach others how to connect to their source and stay in this consciousness of love, peace, kindness, and oneness. When enough of us make this journey back to being in spirit, our groups and collectives will reflect the inspiration I am called to promote in one way or another. As I readied myself to make the shift from an exclusively spiritual being into the world of particles in 1939, I had the following conversation with the creative intelligence I'll call God. God, what would you like to accomplish on this journey you're about to undertake? Me, I'd like to teach self-reliance, compassion, and forgiveness. God, are you certain that this is what you wish to dedicate this entire lifetime to? Me, yes, I can see the need even more clearly now. God, well then I think we'd better put your little ass into a series of foster homes and have you stay there for a decade or so 
where you'll learn to experience relying upon yourself and will remove your parents so that you won't be dissuaded from your mission. Me, I'll accept that, but what about my parents? Who will best facilitate my life's purpose? God. You can select Melvin Lyle Dyer as your father, a prisoner, an alcoholic, and a thief. He'll abandon you as a baby and never show up in your life. You'll first practice hating him and seeking revenge, but you'll ultimately forgive him long after he's left his body. This act of forgiveness will be the single most important event of your life. It will put you on the path that you're signing up for. Me. And my mother? What about her? Take Hazel Dyer, Lyle's wife. Her compassion for all of her children will give you an example to follow. She'll steadfastly work herself to the bone to reunite you and your brothers after ten years or so of her own suffering. Me. Isn't it an awful, cruel fate for my father? God. Not at all. He signed up for this twenty-five years ago. He dedicated this entire lifetime to teach one of his children the lesson of forgiveness. A noble gesture, wouldn't you say? And your mother is here to show you how true compassion shows up every day. Now get down there and participate in becoming a particle. In the introduction of my book, You'll See It When You Believe It, I wrote about finding my father and visiting his grave in the early 1970s. The facts that led me there defy the laws of logic, and visiting it was the final hurdle I needed to overcome before initiating my writing and speaking career, or the mission I'd signed up for back in 1939. I've also visited the Holocaust sites of Europe and read and reread the history of events that contributed to the hatred that created war. In the 1960s, I worked to bring peace to the events surrounding the horrible Vietnam War, and today my attention is often focused on finding an alternative to the violence and hatred in Africa, the Middle East, and particularly Iraq. My calling is deep within me and has a hold on me. I don't know what I'm going to do next, but I'm probably being guided by what Spirit and I decided at the inception of this journey. One thing I know for certain is that I'm inspired. I've described my personal insight about my calling to encourage all of you to examine your own life, including all of its travails and success, as a necessary experience in order to fulfill your mission. Looking at life from this perspective nurtures the deep yearning within that will beckon you back to Spirit. Looking at life from an inspired perspective. As you can see from my own example, it can be a great help to look at your entire life as the unfolding of a plan that you participated in before you even arrived here. By doing so, you shift from blaming others and circumstances to being responsible and feeling your purpose. Whatever shows up in your life then becomes a part of the perfection of this plan. When everything you experience seems unwelcome, for instance, you can search for what you gain from the apparent obstacles. If we can remember that we're responsible for what we're attracting, we can then eliminate the negative energy we wallow in. If what we desire is to be inspired and feel joy, but the opposite keeps showing up, rather than cursing fate, we can view ourselves as simply being out of creative vibrational alignment. We can shift our vibrations in the form of thoughts to those that are more harmonious with our desires, and we can then begin to take the small steps necessary for our inspiration to be sensed. Source energy will cooperate with us when we seek it energetically. Moreover, we can begin to reassess our lives for misaligned attractions and imagined bad luck. When we feel peaceful within ourselves, we begin to attract more of the peace we desire because we're functioning from a spiritual place of peace. When we engage spirit, we regain the power of our ultimate source. Regardless of what goes on in the world of form, inside of ourselves, we'd still be living in spirit. For example, a beggar on a street corner may have agreed to come into this world of boundaries to teach and generate the awareness that leads to more compassion in this world, or even to teach a single person, perhaps you, to become more compassionate. In an infinite universe, there's no time restrictions on how many lifetimes we get. With an infinity before us, spending one lifetime teaching compassion doesn't seem so outrageous. When we feel peaceful within, we begin to attract more of the peace we desire because we're functioning from a spiritual place of peace. When we engage spirit, we regain the power of our ultimate source. An inspirational attitude is less judgmental and more appreciative, with a keen eye for how God or source energy manifests. And remember, source can't be removed from what it creates. Everyone and everything contains God or the source, so be on the lookout for the God force in every living thing. Explore how this force has delivered to us many blessings in disguise. 
we came from a world of pure spirit and allowed that source to take over without any interference or questioning on our part. As long as we were in spirit, our source materialized in a multitude of ways to handle everything for us. Then, almost immediately after our birth into form, we initiated a program to deny spirit and emphasize the ego. But now, as you listen to these words, you're on the threshold of dropping ego identity and returning to a life where inspiration awaits you. Chapter 3 why we left our full-time spiritual identity behind. Quote, A sense of separation from God is the only lack you really need correct. Unquote. From A Course in Miracles. I love that. A sense of separation from God is the only lack you really need correct. We now understand that we were created out of spirit, so it must be a part of us. We also realized that for nine months, we totally trusted in this originating spirit, and all that we needed was provided for. And then we arrived as a pure representation of spirit. So why did most of us trade in the spiritual identity card for one that wants us to believe in things that are non-existent where we came from, such as suffering, and fear, anxiety, limits, and worries? The answer lies in understanding why we left behind our full-time participation in the world of spirit. I've used the term full-time to signify that we're always connected to spirit, even when we think and behave in ways that don't reflect spiritual consciousness. What I'm offering here in this program is the awareness that we can return to a full-time position of inspiration, which is the true meaning of our life. Inspiration can be cultivated and be a driving enthusiasm throughout life, rather than showing up every now and then and just as mysteriously disappearing, seemingly independent of our desire. And it's everyone's divine birthright. That is, it isn't reserved for high-profile creative geniuses in the arts and sciences. The problem is that from birth, we're gradually taught to believe exclusively in the world ruled by club ego, and we put our full-time membership in club spirit on hold. Our Initiation into Club Ego when we arrive in this physical world, we're immediately cared for by well-meaning folks who've been taught to believe in the illusion of what Patanjali called the false self. They think that they're not defined by the spiritual essence from which they came, but by their uniquely special individuality, their possessions, and their accomplishments. They see themselves as separate from each other, from what's materially missing in their lives, and from God. You can see why the word ego is often referred to as an acronym for edging God out, E-G-O. Ego, you see, is an idea that we acquire from our clogged environment, which is stuffed full of ego-dominated folks. I'm not using the word ego to describe overly self-important people who thrive on nauseating delusions of grandeur. Rather, I mean it as a catch-all term for defining identification with the false self. Very early on, ego tells us that we're separate from everyone else, directly contradicting spirit, which reminds us that we share the same life force with everyone. Ego nags us to compete and insists that we've failed when others defeat us or have more than we do. And more than anything else, ego fears our living an inspired life because then we'll have no need for it. As we progressed through our developmental years, we weren't trained to stay in spirit. Quite the opposite. We were constantly reminded that we were what we did in life, and failure to accomplish the kind of life that others saw for us meant that we should feel dejected. Our culture wanted us to learn early that we are what we acquire, and if we have or want very little, then we are very little value. Furthermore, we are what others think of us, so if our reputation is sullied, we're of even less value. We were indoctrinated in these lessons by family, church, community, school, the media, and even strangers. These ego-dominated edicts were force-fed to us and allowed to mute the deep inner voice that beckoned us to remember why we're here. Eventually, we learned to ignore those in-spirit murmurs and replace joy, contentment, and bliss with an emphasis that wonders, what's it all about? We opted to fit in, chasing someone else's dream and counting up our earnings and possessions to measure our level of success. 
the nagging feeling that resulted is the result of relinquishing our true spiritual self as an active participant in this life. But take heart, it never left us and is alive within us today. Ego's Dominating Messages We can start returning to being in spirit by examining what ego has accomplished in our life, as well as making a determined effort to resist the powerful pressures of our culture's ego in favor of an inspired life. Ego is just an illusion, so ask yourself if you wish to continue to be controlled by something that isn't true, or would you rather look into what's real and never changes? Keep in mind that spirit is fixed, permanent, and infinite, while ego comes and goes with the wind. To continue on with this discussion, I've adopted the following list from a fascinating book called The Disappearance of the Universe, published by Hay House in 2004 by Gary Renard, which gives an account of two spiritual visitors teaching Gary the significance of A Course in Miracles. Whether you accept the premise or not is your option. I find these teachings to be profound, and they merit consideration. Number one, the ego says, you're a body. The Holy Spirit says, you're not even a person. You're just like me, your source of being. This teaching shows that our ego insists we're impermanent, which is opposed to our being what Lao Tzu taught, that which never changes. That's what we are, that which never changes. Lao Tzu was a 6th century B.C. mystical spiritual teacher and author of the Tao. When we think about our life here on earth, we can't avoid the awareness that everything we experience, including our body, returns to dust to be recycled by spirit. Our ego finds this concept impossible to accept. 2. The ego says your thoughts are very, very important. The Holy Spirit insists only thoughts you think with God are real. Nothing else matters. This teaching explains that thoughts centering on ourselves, appearance, possessions, fears, or relationship problems are not only unimportant, they're not real. Ouch! The ego flinches at such commentary. But if we examine these thoughts from spirit's infinite perspective, we see that we're indeed unreal. When we're totally immersed in spirit, we only had thoughts of spirit because that's all we were. When we left it behind, we opted for thoughts that our ego told us were important. Of course, in Miracles tells us that we didn't even have to think in heaven because we were thought by God. So we can access permanent inspiration by letting ourselves once again be thought by God and achieve a state of heaven on earth. 3. Your ego says, The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. The Holy Spirit asserts, God only gives and never takes away. When living an inspired life, we're focused on giving our life away and simultaneously observing how it's returned, thus fortifying the idea of what goes around comes around. Ego is constantly telling us to be fearful about losing what we have and warning us of greedy others who will take what's ours. But God doesn't take away from us. As we learn to think this way, we attract more of what's missing in our life. The reason for this is simple. We become what we think about. If we think about giving, like God does, the universe will provide. If we think about things being taken away, then that's what we'll attract. 4. The ego says, there's good and bad. The Holy Spirit maintains, there's nothing to judge because it isn't real in the first place. When we accept the ego identification card, we agree to judge almost everyone and everything in terms of good or bad. The problem with this is that we all contain the same spirit from which we originated. If I make you bad and myself good, for instance, I deny the presence of spirit in you whom I elected to judge. God sees it quite differently. Our spiritual source knows that only it is real. All of the ephemeral world of form and boundaries is not of its infinite nature. At our core, the place where we all originated from and returned to, there's no one and nothing to judge. This takes some time to get used to, but once we grasp the truth of this observation, we're free to tap into authentic inspiration. 5. The ego directs love and hate toward individuals. The Holy Spirit's love is nonspecific and all-encompassing. Ego directs us to love some, be indifferent toward many, and hate all others. When we learn to be back in spirit on a full-time basis, we discover what we knew in our pre-ego time. There's no they. There's only one. 
The one source of all-encompassing love knows nothing of boundaries, differing customs, geographic divisions, family splits, or differences in race, creed, sex, and so on. It only knows love for all. Jesus points so perfectly to the differences between ego and spirit. When we were in spirit, we were a child of our Father in heaven. And, quote, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. Matthew 5.45. This, of course, means that it's all one. Evil, good, righteous, and unrighteous are all the same. Some move away from the Father and some move toward him. This is such an important and powerful lesson to get as we move toward becoming inspired by living in spirit. 6. The ego devises clever reasons why we should continue to listen to its selfish counsel. The Holy Spirit is certain that at some point we'll turn toward it and ultimately return. Ego will tout its irresistible logic to assure us that our body, our possessions, and our achievements are all very real and important. It convinces us by insisting that what's real is what we can see, touch, hear, taste, and smell. Therefore, invisible spirit isn't real. So ego continues to be attached to stuff and to make the acquisition of money and power a lifelong objective. To that end, it wants us to disdain forgiveness in favor of seeking revenge. Very persuasive logic when we look around and see almost everyone doing just that. Through the lens of inspiration, however, we're able to see how ego has distorted the message of the Holy Spirit. Instead of seeking revenge, we're more likely to see a very sad nation of strivers and virtually no arrivers, a gaggle of pill poppers searching outside of themselves for a resolution to their depressing, anxiety-filled, joyless, and often lonely lives. As we return to the Holy Spirit, we'll no longer be under the influence of ego's absurd counsel. And seven. The ego wants us to regret our past. The Holy Spirit wants us to practice unconditional forgiveness. The Holy Spirit isn't limited by a past or a future. There's only the eternal now. Any energy we place on what transpired in the past is groundwork for guilt, and ego loves guilt. Such negative energy fabricates an excuse for why our present moments are troubled and gives us a cop-out, a reason to stay out of spirit. And thinking about what we've been or what we did wrong in the past are great impediments to an inspired life. On the other hand, when we're inspired, we're totally engaged in the now. In an infinite, never-beginning, and never-ending universe, there can be no past. All guilt and regret simply serve as ways to avoid being here in the only moment we have, which is now. This is where we reconnect to spirit, now. If we choose to use up this holy instant with regrets about a past that's only an illusory thought, then we're unable to be in the joyful, loving, peaceful present moment. Cramming this holy moment with thoughts of guilt, remorse, and regret is great for ego and keeps us totally resistant to being in spirit. These seven messages are the dominant ones the ego drones on about. If we don't listen, it will try to drown out inspiration by intensifying worrisome and fearful thoughts. I've managed to tame this annoying voice of the ego so that its influence is almost negligible in my life. And I know you can, too. How I Learned to Slay the Ego Intruder I realize that the ego's voice has most of us convinced that we're powerless to manage our own destiny. There was a time when I felt much more kindly toward the ego since it plays such a dominant role in the lives of so many people, almost everyone, in fact. But today, I see it as something that needs to be destroyed. I no longer agree that since it's in our lives, we might just as well learn to love and accept it, troublesome as it may be, nor do I believe that it serves some useful purpose. Knowing that we've been created in the image of our Creator, and therefore have the same essence and the same ultimate potential, means that ego is out of the picture. Ego denies our original invisible reality, so it must be removed and completely banished from our awareness. Realizing that ego is a traitor to our greatness is what ultimately set me free of its pull. I keep remembering that ego isn't real, even as it still protests and attempts to delete my feelings of inspiration. My highest self responds with, but remember, Wayne, what's trying to drag you down isn't real. What also helps to keep me on track is parenting. 
I'm the father of eight children, so I can recall thousands of instances of being sucked into a black hole of confusion and uncertainty with my kids, arguments with them concerning schoolwork, questionable friendships, curfews, staying at a pal's house, dress codes, dating, cigarettes or drugs, what was right from my perspective and wrong from theirs, and vice versa, and on and on and on this list could go. There was anger and hurt feelings, sleepless nights, and of course, much happiness, joy, and contentment as well. As I look back on those years of parent-child conflicts, I realize today, in this now moment, that none of it exists. It isn't real because it's in the changing world of time and space. Similarly, I now realize that every conflict or struggle that exists, as well as those experiences I'd call good and joyful, are not real from the inspirational point of view. So if anything I experience is immediately going to fall into illusion, why not simply stay connected to spirit through it all? While I still have occasions when I slip today, I'm able to say that every conflict I have with my mostly now adult children, or anyone else for that matter, isn't really between me and them. It's between me and God. I look for a way to be like God and stay loving, caring, forgiving, and peaceful within myself, suspending my need to be right and knowing that in the next moment it will all be gone, which is true of everything that's being played out in this illusory world. I want to emphasize that I'm not suggesting that peace means being in a place where there's no noise or trouble. Rather, it means that in the midst of turmoil, I can still feel calm. Not one of the things that I was so upset and out of control over matters today. Not one. It's all illusion fed by my ego's need to make me important by winning, being right, or coming out on top. The best way I can think of to summarize and conclude this chapter in this program is to take you back to the opening quotation from A Course in Miracles. To me, this observation helps us understand why we've left our spiritual identification. Quote, a sense of separation from God is the only lack you really need correct. Now let's go to work on correcting that separation. Chapter 4. How it feels to return to spirit. Quote, the aim and purpose of human life is the unitive knowledge of God. Unquote. Aldous Huxley. This much should be really clear by now. We originated in a field of energy that has no boundaries. Before entering the world of form, we were in spirit, a piece of God, if you will. We began entering this physical world first as a particle, then as a cell, then as a fetus, then as an infant, and ultimately as a fully developed human being. But our ultimate purpose all along was to experience the unitive knowledge of God, as Huxley so beautifully puts it. Sadly, when we began our human training, we were taught to abandon most of our spiritual identity and adopt a new one based on ego's consciousness or a sense of being separate from spirit. In other words, we came here from a place of inspiration and intended to stay that way. Unfortunately, we forgot to do so, and we ended up abandoning most of our inspiring notions in favor of a consensus of reality that didn't include spirit. We chose the false self, which is why we so inexplicably feel off-purpose so frequently. In the West, traditional psychology hasn't wholeheartedly embraced the existence of Atman, the Godhead within humans, and our psychological and spiritual teachings don't teach us how to achieve the union of perfect yoga for this kind of learning, we'd have to study with a teacher of yoga or organized religion. Now we'd like to reconnect to the world of spirit, while at the same time not shed the familiar body we've worn for a lifetime. That's where Patanjali's teachings come in. Patanjali was considered a saint in his lifetime, teaching sutras, the essential threads of a philosophy, that elevated human beings to their highest potential. He taught about knowing God through the practice of meditation and yoga in order to attain a point of union with the Source. He also described our ability to perform miracles. These feats involved specific spiritual aphorisms and the daily practice of yoga. The remainder of this chapter is devoted to my impression of Patanjali's 2,300 or so year old observation on inspiration. When you are inspired, my personal view of the six ideas presented here includes my belief in the existence of a God consciousness within every one of us. 
And my purpose in the next few moments of this program is to help you achieve this perfect union of yoga and live from this inspired perspective every day. Here's what Patanjali offered us more than 2,000 years ago, which is the most profound statement I've ever found on the significance of the role of our ultimate calling. When you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, all your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends limitations. Your consciousness expands in every direction, and you find yourself in a new, great, and wonderful world. Dormant forces, faculties, and talents come alive, and you discover yourself to be a greater person by far than you ever dreamed yourself to be. Patanjali opens his aphorism with an observation on inspiration and follows it up with six conclusions. These six key points are the basis for the next few moments in this chapter, as they describe what it feels like when we return to the world of spirit. Number one, when you are inspired, all your thoughts break their bonds. As I explained earlier, being inspired is equivalent to being back in spirit. Before we showed up in form, our mind and the mind of God were synonymous, which means that we were free from the bonds of the ego mind. This is simply how the world of spirit works. It's impossible to have limiting boundaries or self-imposed shackles placed on us. When we're in harmony with the mind of God, we simply don't have thoughts that tell us we can't accomplish something. After all, our thoughts are of a higher energy. Returning to spirit results in a grand sense of being in tune with our uniquely divine purpose. Just imagine being able to go on and on for hours at a time without experiencing fatigue or hunger or thirst or mental exhaustion, all thanks to one factor, the willingness to be back in spirit. I've personally found that when I have thoughts of being inspired by some great purpose or extraordinary project, I let go of fatigue, that is, being in spirit somehow eliminates thoughts that send the I'm exhausted signals to my body. In the middle of writing or speaking or touring with my family or playing a tennis match or anything that inspires me, all bonds are shattered by my mind and fatigue is impossible. Furthermore, matching up my desires with plans and behavior in the form of my thoughts and actions breaks down the bonds of hunger and discomfort. I've literally written for up to 14 hours without eating or experiencing any hunger pangs. Somehow being inspired allows my thoughts to remove any of the bonds that can serve as excuses not to do what I know I'm here to accomplish. This observation that Patanjali made so long ago is awesome. Why not practice returning to spirit and allowing all thoughts to be in agreement with that originating spirit? Your thoughts will work on your body and surroundings, transforming obstacles into the fulfillment of your desires. Two. When you are inspired, your mind transcends limitations. When we're inspired, we remember that God is always in us and we're always in God. So we're incapable of thinking limited thoughts. We're transcendent. We've gone beyond the world of boundaries and entered a space of creative knowing. In other words, we surrender. We put ourselves under the guidance and control of our purposeful force. I can personally vouch for this surrendering process. During my life, I've had an unshakable faith in my ability to attract money and prosperity. Even as a youngster living in foster homes, I always felt I was entitled to have wealth. I just knew there was an inexhaustible supply and that it was totally neutral, simply an energy that goes wherever it's called to go. I don't know why I've known this my entire life, but I know it even more today. A television interviewer once asked me if I ever felt guilty about making so much money from my writings and recordings. I responded, much to her surprise, I would feel guilty, except that it's not my fault. When she asked what I meant, I explained that money has always come to me because I've always felt within me that I am money. I attract prosperity because I feel entitled to it. In fact, I feel that it's actually a definition of me. Money has always come to me, and because it has, I direct it wherever I perceive it to be needed. It's simply an energy system that my mind has created. It flows to me because it's who I am. I've never doubted that I came from an energy source of pure, unlimited abundance. And because of my unshakable faith, I've always acted on this prosperity consciousness. I've never known a moment of unemployment through good or bad economic times. 3. When you are inspired, your consciousness expands in every direction. When we're in spirit, every direction is possible for us at every moment because our consciousness happens within our mind. Now, this inner world of ours, reunited with its originating essence, doesn't think in only one direction. Rather, it allows all possibilities. 
our consciousness is in the absolute state of allowing. All resistance in the form of thoughts is non-existence. I'm speaking here of a feeling that comes over us when we're inspired by a great purpose, an extraordinary project. When we experience the bliss of an expanded consciousness with the unsurpassed allowing of any and all possibilities to enter our daily life. We cease looking for answers in a directional way. They don't come from someplace north or west of us, nor are they arriving from up above or impeded by something down below. We begin to feel the larger sense of life, what being a part of all is like once again. Is there any place that God isn't? And if we came from God, then mustn't we be like God? You see, we're already connected to everything we need when we're inspired. What takes place is a realignment within us that allows for everything, every event, and every person to merge in our inspired consciousness. When we re-emerge into the perfect oneness of spirit, we view everyone we meet as an ally through our inspired way of life. We feel extraordinarily guided and attract people, events, and circumstances to join us in our inspired state because our world has transcended from the elementary cause and effect, birth to death path, to all directions simultaneously. We're living at maximum allowing. With non-existent resistance, we're back in spirit. 4. When you are inspired, you find yourself in a new, great, and wonderful world. In 1976, I made the choice to live in spirit on a full-time basis. I resigned from my professorship at St. John's University to teach and write on a much larger stage. I knew within myself that I was finally listening in earnest to the inner voice that chose my destiny before I was conceived. I incarnated here to teach self-reliance and to help our planet move to a more unified means of living heaven on earth, but I was here for 35 years before devoting myself exclusively to my mission. At the age of 36, I was consumed by my writing and by telling the world about my book, Your Erroneous Owns. I was filled with excitement and passion about what I was involved in. I had never felt as complete in my previous 35 years, even though I had an exciting and thoroughly satisfying career teaching and counseling. The moment I resigned from being an employee to living my dream, when I mustered up the courage to be in spirit, lives in my mind even today, some 30 years later. I found myself in a new, great, and wonderful world. It was as if a huge blanket had been removed from me and breezes were allowed to refresh me at every turn I made. The world became my oyster when I shifted into the world of inspiration. Suddenly I began receiving requests to appear on radio and TV shows to discuss what I believed in so passionately. The more I spoke from what I now recognize as inspiration, the more invitations I received. Radio hosts began asking me to fill in, sometimes for six or seven hours on all-night shows, and then for a week at a time in cities across the country. I stayed with my inspiration, loving every moment, working 18-hour days, and being willing to do whatever it took to stay in spirit. Soon national shows took an interest in me, and all the while, precisely the right people showed up to teach and guide me through this process. Publicists, editors, book distributors, talent coordinators, travel agents, bankers, everyone who was needed kept surfacing. All I had to do was stay inspired and follow my bliss, in the words of Joseph Campbell. It was as if a gigantic hand was pulling the right strings. Moment by moment, day by day, I was in awe of it all at the time, and I'm still in awe as I write these words many years later and speak to you today. More than ever, I trust in Patanjali's advice, now, today, to stay in spirit. This is not to say that many obstacles didn't surface as they continue to today. There are times when I still can't fathom why I have to go through so many difficulties. At the age of 65, I thought I was through with heartbreak, yet I still have it coming at me. A debilitating heart attack, a personal tragedy in my private life, and serious addiction challenges within my family have all been recent occurrences. Despite all the hardships that have surfaced, I've found that all these experiences are valuable because of the compassion, forgiveness, and kindness that I've developed. These so-called negative situations have impacted my writing and speaking and have caused me to reach out to a much larger audience through public television where I offer a positive, inspired message. My lesson has been to stay in spirit and step outside my body and my life circumstances to observe all that has and continues to flow to me from a perspective of detachment. It's not about me. It's about staying in spirit, knowing that all that comes my way is a divine blessing, even the struggles. Five. When you are inspired, dormant forces, faculties, and talents become alive. I know that forces exist to guide me through every stage of this program and all of my writing. 
When I pick up a book, I often open it to precisely the right page, and exactly what I need appears before me. I smile inwardly and say aloud, Thank you, God. You're always there for me when I write, seemingly alone here in my dining room and looking out at this magnificent ocean. I love watching those dormant forces come alive and guide me in my own inspired offerings. I so appreciate the talents that's rested within me for so long, coming alive when I do what I know I'm here to do. I certainly couldn't access the forces if I were living at the ordinary level of consciousness that had been laid out for me by external, well-meaning forces. I can only access the dormant forces when I'm inspired, that is, when I let go of my ego demands and re-enter that magical realm of spirit. These dormant forces will come to all of us. They're actually alive and well and have been working on our behalf for as long as we've been here. Yet they appear to be dead to some because they've left behind their divine purpose, which we decided on long before we ever took on the insane ego. And six, when you're inspired, you discover yourself to be a greater person by far than you ever dreamed yourself to be. The act of being inspired by some great purpose allows us to feel the essence of a spiritual being having a human experience rather than the other way around. Patanjali suggests that we could never even dream of our greatness because we've been imprisoned by our beliefs about who we are. We brought into the idea that we were limited in our ability to create an all-encompassing life, and we were certain that we had no choice in our own destiny. We defended our need to acquire more and to live a scarcity consciousness in which we competed with everyone else for a meager slice of the whole pie. All of these imprisoning thoughts result when we're not guided by spirit. Moving into a state of inspiration removes all of those restraining ideas. As Patanjali notes, we'll discover someone we couldn't imagine because we were incarcerated in ego's jail, imprisoned by what we now recognize from our inspired viewpoint as an illusion. The poet Rabindranath Tagore, winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1913, writes of those who live exclusively in the false identity of the ego. Quote, he who, in the world of men, goes about singing for alms from door to door with his one-stringed instrument and long robe of patched-up rags on his back. Unquote. Tagore is describing how limited our thoughts and our lives are when we're not in spirit. As we move toward heeding the ultimate calling, we no longer live exclusively in the world of men. So we know that we all have greatness awaiting us. We need to awaken from the bad dream that has stupefied us in the fog of ego and live from the blissful perspective offered by being in spirit. Remember the words of Michelangelo. The greater danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and achieving our mark. When we were in spirit, prior to materializing, our aim was high and our expectations were godlike. Reacquaint yourself with that vision and begin living an inspired life. Chapter 5. Finding Your Way to an Inspired Life Quote, If we examine every stage of our lives, we find that from our first breath to our last, we are under this constraint of circumstances, and yet we still possess the greatest of all freedoms, the power of developing our innermost selves in harmony with the moral order of the universe, and so winning peace at heart whatever obstacles we meet. It's easy to say this and to write this, but it always remains a task to which every day must be devoted. Every morning cries to us, do what you ought and trust what may be. Johann von Goethe 
When I speak about inspiration and purpose, I frequently hear people ask, but what if I don't really know what would inspire me? Or how do I find my purpose when nothing seems to resonate with me at the level of bliss you speak about? That's why this particular part of this program and the following ones are dedicated to my heartfelt answers to these questions, which seem most bothersome to those who'd really love to heed their ultimate calling. Just the mere act of questioning our ability to live an inspired life represents resistance that we need to examine because it implies that we're deficient in our spiritual quest. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth. In the world of spirit from whence we came, there are no deficits, no lacks or shortages, and there's definitely no such thing as purposelessness. This is an intelligent system that we're a part of. We're divine beings who are a piece of the entire pie of creation. By questioning our ability to activate a connection to inspiration, we give evidence of our lack of belief in our divinity. With this minor reproach in mind, I'll now explain ways to believe in and connect with your ultimate calling. First, in order to put to rest any question regarding your personal right to live an inspired life, we must claim our own divinity, all of us. The fundamental truth each of us needs to affirm is, I am a divine creation. All creation has purpose. I am here to be like God. We should tattoo this statement on our consciousness and wear it proudly. We must begin the process of getting in spirit with a firm declaration from which we never waver. Here's a poetic reminder of this truth from Walt Whitman. Quote, Perhaps the deepest, most eternal thought latent in the human soul is the thought of God merged in the thoughts of moral right and the immortality of identity. Great, great is this thought. I greater than all else. Unquote. The thought of God merged in the thoughts of moral right. I love that. Yes, as Whitman says, this thought of being merged with God is greater than any we could ever have. Once we've accepted this, we can move on to knowing why we're here and what inspires us. We can begin to trust in the intelligence that beats our heart 50 or 60 times every minute and at the same time turns the earth once every 24 hours, keeps the planets aligned, and creates every millisecond. Our job is to be as much like the source of all beings as we can be. And the nagging question about what inspires us and why we're here dissolves in this grand desire. Once we declare our holy divine nature to be our essence, rather than something to be verified, it all seems so obvious. The journey to feeling purposeful and inspired begins by seeking to be like God in all of our thoughts and all of our actions. I quoted Goethe at the beginning of this chapter because I consider him to be among the most intellectually and spiritually gifted Renaissance men who ever lived. Ponder on his words thoughtfully as you listen to this program, and keep in mind that every one of us is capable of being inspired every day of our life. After all, this is our entitlement offered by God with whom we collaborated before ever arriving here in the first place. Blocking the Bliss of Inspiration Basically, we have two choices for meeting any problem that seems to be blocking us from the bliss of inspiration. The first is the way of frailty, in which we assure ourselves that we're weak and incapable. Frustration, grief, fears, and tears are the hallmarks of this choice, wherein we attempt to cure a wrong with another wrong. The frailty method multiplies tensions by focusing on what's missing, and often invites the advice of others in an attempt to resolve our inner tension and lack of inspiration. The second choice is to go within and know that at our core, beyond all physical and mental factors, there resides the spirit that's always connected to God. Any problem, and I emphasize any problem, represents our inability to consciously connect to our source in the moment. With a conscious connection, we don't seek the advice of others. We seek information. So our decisions are made between ourselves and our Creator. We frequently have quiet interchanges with God, and we know and trust that spiritual guidance is available as an alignment of energy. When we feel inspired, we recognize that we need to make a vibrational adjustment that puts our thoughts and behaviors back in alignment with the desire to be inspired. Then, when this realignment takes place, we can laugh at the folly of seeking something outside of ourselves, such as an activity or a job to inspire us. By simply realigning and harmonizing with spirit, we let inspiration blossom in the field of harmony. Listening to the Voice of God 
When we make the decision to become a being of sharing and practice keeping our thoughts harmonized with spirit energy on a daily basis, our purpose will not only find us, it will chase after us wherever we go. Since we've become aligned with our Creator, we won't be able to escape it. You see, when we live as much of life as possible in God-realization, nothing can go wrong. What and who we need will surface, and we'll notice that we can't escape feeling that something much greater than our individual life is at work within us and around us. Our number one relationship must be to this creative energy of God. When we go to our source, we activate the energy that reconnects us to our purpose. Inspiration then shows up right before our eyes, even when we may have stopped thinking about it. Our purpose manifests in many ways and won't be limited to a career slot. In fact, it's often something that requires us to leave a particular kind of employment to pursue something we'd never even considered before. We must trust that inspiration is already here. It only eludes us because we've disconnected in some way from the spirit that was and always will be our essence. I recently received a letter from a woman in Kansas that illustrates this message perfectly. Just out of the blue, she felt compelled to do something that she'd never contemplated before, and voila, she was inspired and remains so today. With Gail's permission, here is her letter, which has been edited for clarity. For more on Japa, which is a form of meditation, please refer to my book, Getting in the Gap. Dear Wayne, Thank you so much for your presentations and tapes. You are frequently my traveling companion as I drive in my job. I just wanted to add my testimony to the power of Japa. I was an on and off again meditator, but realized how much more smoothly my days went when I was on it. I visited Kenya, Africa in June of 2002 and met an eight-year-old orphan girl there. As I sat on the ground, she crawled into my lap and a voice said, Take her home. I physically turned around, but no one was there. Again, the voice said, Take her home. I asked my 18-year-old daughter, who was with me on the trip, what she thought about my adopting this beautiful child. With the quickness of a sprinter, she replied, Go for it. When we returned to the States a week later, I realized that if I didn't follow through with this adoption, I'd always regret it. Regret seemed much larger than the task of adopting. I began doing japa each morning, and through a series of miracles, the baby was able to come to this country, accompanied by a newly made friend. Nellie's adoption was part two of God's plan. Part one had unfolded a couple of years before when I felt guided to sponsor a series of workshops for which I profited $10,000 with very little time or work. And guess what the final cost of adopting Nellie was? The first time I heard the voice, I chose to disregard it and or think it through, making lists of pros and cons. But I couldn't rest until I proceeded with the workshops. That's how I explained to my family that I needed to proceed with adopting Nellie. Obedience had brought abundance into our lives, and now it was time to share that abundance. Nellie has brought the abundance of love and forgiveness into our home. She is truly a treasure. Thank you for sharing your gift of this wonderful meditation. It, it changed my life and the life of a little girl. Sincerely, Gail Beal, Topeka, Kansas. Gail used her meditation practice to stay connected to her creator, and when a small orphan child in Kenya crawled into her lap, purpose did indeed find her. Gail calls this God's plan, but she's actually a piece of God. She came from God, so she must be like what she came from. Hence, God's plan is her plan, and vice versa. In her meditation practice, Gail heard a voice. That voice belonged to her highest self, the part that never left spirit, is always inspired, and can be heard when allowed to come through. It's a voice that lives in each and every one of us. Creating and Holding On to Our Vision the desire to find our way to inspiration involves creating a vision of living in spirit 100% of the time. Even if we don't have a clue what we should be doing or what our mission is, we need to practice creating this vision anyway. Our inner picture has to be based on our intention to feel good, which is, of course, synonymous with feeling God, good and God. If we made this an inner mantra, I intend to feel good, we can picture ourselves experiencing joy regardless of what's going on around us. We can remind ourselves that whatever we desire is on its way in amounts greater than ever imagined. If we keep this vision uppermost in mind, then before long, the all-creating source will conspire to bring our vision into our physical life. Most important, we'll begin to act on our vision and receive divine guidance. The truth is that we react to the vision we create and hold, and so do all of the cells in our body. 
So it's vitally important to hold a clear vision of ourselves as deserving of feeling inspired, knowing that it's our ultimate calling, and choosing to be in spirit even when everything around us suggests otherwise. We need to opt to be a being of sharing, living as close to God-realization as is possible. The ancient Persian poet Rumi states this so perfectly with the following lines. Quote, The garden of the world has no limits except in your mind. Its presence is more beautiful than the stars, with more clarity than the polished mirror of your heart. Unquote. Clear your mind of limits and move into spirit, whose presence, as Rumi tells us, is more beautiful than the stars. Here's a question that Ralph Waldo Emerson posed, which I'd like you to ponder before going on to the next part of this program. We are very near to greatness. One step and we are safe. Can we not take the leap? One step. Surely you can take one step for your own inspired greatness. Part 2 the Fundamentals of Inspiration Chapter 6 Essential Principles for Finding Your Way to an Inspired Life Quote, Well, every man has a religion, has something in heaven or earth which he will give up everything else for, something which absorbs him, which, which may be regarded by others as being useless. Yet it is his dream, it is his lodestar, it is his master, that, whatever it is, seized upon me, made me its servant, its slave, induced me to set aside the other ambitions, a trail of glory in the heavens, which I followed, followed with a full heart. When once I am convinced, I never let go. Walt Whitman This chapter presents six principles that are important to observe as we seek an inspired life. They're a blueprint to refer to as we reconstruct a life in spirit. I'm listing them here and talking about them in no particular order of importance because I believe they're all equally essential. Principle number one, be independent of the good opinion of others. There are many well-meaning people in our lives who have ideas about what we should or shouldn't be doing. Relatives tend to be specialists in this area. If we let them guide us with advice that isn't congruent with our inner calling, will suffer the anguish, the slings and arrows, if you will, of an uninspired life. Each of us can feel what we're being called to be. When we pay attention, we can hear our own impatient voices coaxing us to pay attention and complete the assignments we brought with us from the world of spirit. But when we allow the opinions and dictates of others to determine what we're doing or what we're going to be, we lose sight of our objective to live an inspired life. We need to determine for ourselves exactly how much we've allowed others to decide issues such as what we do, where we live, with whom we live, and even how we're treated. We must know that absolutely no one else truly knows and feels what we're here to accomplish. So we must give ourselves permission to hear our inner guidance and ignore the pressure from others. Regardless of how absurd our inner calling might seem, it's authentically ours and doesn't have to make sense to anyone else. The willingness to listen and act on our inspiration, independent of the opinion of others, is imperative. Principle number two, be willing to accept the disapproval of others. Logically following the previous principle, this one notes that we're going to incur the disfavor of many people when we follow our inclinations to be in spirit and live the life we came here to live. This isn't a selfish or a cynical attitude. When we begin to follow our ultimate calling, there will be a lot of resistance. In fact, the purpose of the slings and arrows sent our way is to get us to change our mind and be reasonable, which translates to, do it my way. However, as we gain the strength to ignore the pressure to conform, resistance will diminish and ultimately change to respect. When we steadfastly refuse to think, act, and conform to the mandates of others, the pressure to do so loses its momentum. All we have to do is endure some initial disapproval, such as dogmatic persuasion, anger, pouting, silence, and long-winded lectures, and then we're on our way to inspiration rather than frustration. The people who receive the most approval in life 
are the ones who care the least about it. So technically, if we want the approval of others, we need to stop caring about it and turn our attention to becoming an inspired being of sharing. One little note of caution here. When we raise our children according to these principles and they observe us living them on a daily basis, we'll have to deal with their determination to respect their inner calling. For example, when my daughter Summer was about 11 years old and I asked to see her report card, I was a bit taken aback by her response, Why do you want to see it? she asked me. When I said, Well, I, I, I'm your father and I, and I think I should know how you're doing in school, she just matter-of-factly replied, But these are my grades. They're not yours. And if I thought you needed to see them, I would have shown them to you already. I assure you that she wasn't being disrespectful. She simply had no need to share her grades with me. And since I knew that she was doing very well in school, I let it go and let her be who she wanted to be. Principle number three, stay detached from outcomes. Inspiration doesn't come from completing tasks or meeting goals. In fact, that's the surest way to have it elude you. Returning to spirit, you see, is an experience of living fully in the present moment. Our purpose in life isn't to arrive at a destination where we find inspiration, just as the purpose of dancing isn't to end up at a particular spot on the dance floor. The purpose of dancing and of life is to enjoy every moment and every step, regardless of where we are, when the music stops. Yoga master Sri Swami Sivananda offered the only worthwhile goal I know of when he said that the goal of life is God-realization. Now here's a goal that I can live with. After all, this allows me to live in spirit every moment of my life while simultaneously thinking ahead to the next God-realized moment and the next. As the great Indian sage Ramana Maharshi once remarked, there is no goal to be reached. There is nothing to be attained. You are the self. You exist always. Now this to me is real inspiration. While I was writing the book Inspiration, Your Ultimate Calling, I didn't really have a goal in mind. I just trusted that the book would be completed. I'd seen it. Even though I was months away from the final product, I lived in the bliss of creating right then, right now, in the moment, and I relished every one of those moments. I trust that the outcome will be handled by the same source that inspires these words to appear seemingly out of nowhere. I'm here now, in peace, in love, and in awe. And my only goal, as I was writing, was to stay in this consciousness and enjoy every moment, putting into practice what I agreed to when I was in spirit before coming the particle that began this glorious, glorious journey. Principle number four. Know that we need nothing, no things to be inspired. We came into this world of boundaries from a formless energy field of spirit. We arrived here with no thing no things. We'll make our exit with no things. Nothing. And our purpose, God-realization, requires nothing. No things. We are all that we need to be inspired and living on purpose. And the things that continue to flow into our lives are just symbols of the unlimited abundance of our source. In other words, these things have no value in and of themselves because everything in the physical world is changing and will dissolve back to nothingness anyway. The objective universe is not made up of things. It's made up of waves of motion that simulate the things we're taught to believe are real. Once we accept that, from an infinite perspective, everything we see in nature isn't really what it seems to be, we're able to convert what we view with our eyes into a knowing about all things. Then we can recognize that the objects we believed we needed to feel inspired are nothing from spirit's perspective. This is what distinguishes the physical person from the spiritual person the inspired person from the uninspired person. When we tune in to what we know rather than what we see, we immediately find that every thought of God is repeated throughout the universe. We can watch as some things enter our lives and others leave, all the while remaining in spirit, knowing that all of those things have nothing to do with our state of inspiration. We need nothing more to be inspired since we're connected to spirit already. The ancient Persian poet Omar Khayyam offered us these words, which summarize this principle that we don't need another thing to be inspired. It's all right here, right now. He said, Forget the day that has been cut off from thy existence. Disturb not thyselves about tomorrow, which has not yet come. Rest not upon that which is no more. Live happily one instant, and throw not thy life to the winds. Principle number five. 
Don't die wondering. This principle is extremely important in working toward an inspired life because it motivates us to act. After all, we don't want to be full of regrets because we failed to heed our ultimate calling. Attempting to do something, even if it doesn't succeed, is inspiring because we don't tend to regret what we do, we regret what we didn't do. Even following a futile attempt, we're inspired because we know that we gave it a shot. It's it's wondering whether we should or shouldn't try something that leaves us feeling stressed and incomplete. When I'm playing a tennis match and being tentative in anticipation of losing a point, for example, I've created a situation in which I'll wonder what kind of a game it would have been had I really gone for it. It's in these moments that I remind myself, Wayne, don't die wondering. Inspiration has nothing to do with whether we win or lose. In fact, if we just play the game of life, we'll have plenty of wins and losses regardless of our talent level. If we fail to even try because of fear of rejection or doubt about our talent, we're going to go through life wondering, and that's what keeps us from finding and feeling inspiration. Most of us, myself included, can remember the intensity of our first romantic attraction. Just as we can recall what happened when we didn't follow our inspiration, I've always wondered what would have happened if I'd been able to act on that strong inner call in high school when I had an enormous crush on a beautiful girl named Janice Nelson. I wanted to ask her out, but I let my fear of being rejected keep me from taking the steps to act upon my inner desires. On several occasions, I even dialed her phone number and hung up when she answered. I never overcame my foreboding thoughts and, in effect, was left to die wondering. Many years later, I danced with Janice at our 30-year high school reunion and told her how I felt back then. I even confessed the way I'd hang up the phone because of my trepidation. Janice, to my everlasting delight and chagrin, said, I always had a crush on you, too. I would have loved to have gone out with you. and In fact, I tried to leave you clues to call me, but you never did. Ouch! That's a perfect example of regretting what I didn't do. Principle number six, remember that our desires won't arrive by our schedule. There's an ancient aphorism that goes, if you really want to make God laugh, tell God your plans. In essence, this means that all we desire will arrive in our life when and only when we're aligned vibrationally with the energy of our source. Our ego won't be consulted or get to determine the schedule. Creation reveals its secrets when it's good and ready. Our job is to take the focus off of the when and put it on being connected to our originating spirit. Our job is to stop challenging and demanding responses from God and instead be more like God. Our job is to understand and accept that all of the things that show up in our life which we often find contradictory or troublesome, are there because we've attracted them. And we need to have these obstacles in order to clear an opening for our true spirit purpose to emerge. This may require a change in thinking patterns, which is something Tom Barber knows all too well. Tom is the head golf pro at Griffith Park in Los Angeles and owns and operates the Tom Barber Golf Center in Southern California. His father, Jerry, was the PGA champion in 1961. Tom is a close friend whom I can talk to straight about virtually anything. For example, he once admitted to me that business had fallen off and he was concerned about a deterioration in income due to fewer customers golfing in an economy on the downturn. He'd gone on for about as long as I was willing to absorb this kind of energy when I finally said, Tom, you're approaching the whole issue from a perspective that almost guarantees that this financial headache will continue to grow. Try affirming what I desire is on its way. It will arrive precisely on God's timetable, not on mine. Everything that I'm experiencing now is disguised as a problem, but I know that it's a blessing. What I desire is on its way, and it's coming to me in amounts even greater than I can imagine. This is my vision, and I'll hold on to it in a state of gratitude no matter what. I received a letter from my friend about two months after our conversation in which he wrote, Thanks for the pep talk. Once I started to say that the business I'm seeking and the finances I need are on their way, everything started to turn around. What happened is that Tom decided to align with the unrestricted abundance of spirit energy. As you can see from Tom's example, rather than making demands of God to follow our schedule in order to feel inspired, we can let go, surrender, and remind ourselves that all is in divine order. We're much more successful when we allow inspiration to flow in on God's terms than when we're impatient and demanding. As always, our job in God realization is to become more like God. That means surrendering to the timetable that's always perfect, even when it seems to be full of errors. Keep these six principles handy and access them anytime you find yourself lacking inspiration. 
Remember, too, that we're called to this world of inspiration, which beckons us to let go and let God, as they say in the recovery movement. I also love this advice, which was tendered by one of my favorite teachers, Napoleon Hill. If you can't do great things, do small things in a great way. Don't wait for great opportunities. Seize common, everyday ones and make them great. Chapter 7 Inspiration and Your Own Magnificence Quote, What is necessary to change a person is to change his awareness of himself. Unquote. Abraham Maslow Second quote You are a primary existence. You are a distinct portion of the essence of God and contain a certain part of Him in yourself. Why then are you ignorant of your noble birth? You carry a God about within you, poor wretch, and know nothing of it. Epictetus, a former Roman slave and philosopher. In this chapter, we'll look at our divine magnificence and examine the ways in which we can view ourselves in these terms for the rest of our lives. How would we think and act in daily life if we were truly aware of our divine essence? Obviously, there wouldn't be room to reproach yourself because we wouldn't doubt our abilities. In fact, we'd never look in the mirror and feel anything but love and appreciation. We'd see ourselves as fully capable of attracting all we desire. We'd treat our body with reverence and care, giving thanks for its divine design. We'd celebrate every thought we have, knowing its divine origin, and we'd become aware of our enormous talents and be awed by all that we are. We need to encourage the awareness of our magnificence in every regard. When that awareness has been reawakened, the seedlings of inspiration will begin blossoming. Here's a way of expressing these fundamental truths offered by the writings of the Baha'i Faith. This most great, this fathomless and surging ocean is near, astonishingly near, unto you. Behold, it is closer to you than your life vain. Swift as the twinkling of an eye, you can, if you but wish it, reach and partake of this imperishable favor, this God-given grace, this incorruptible gift, this most potent and unspeakably glorious bounty. There's no way to be in spirit without a changed awareness. So when we accomplish this, we give ourselves the gift of moving from being flawed, limited, lacking, and imperfect to being completely comfortable with our magnificence. This unspeakably glorious bounty is so close to us, all we have to do is make a few twinkling of an eye adjustments. So why not begin right now? Here are three of the most obvious and important changes in awareness that you can make. 1. Changing the awareness of our magnificent talents and abilities. I want to emphasize an extremely important point. I'm not talking about self-esteem here nor am I referring to levels of confidence. Rather, I'm saying that we need to keep the important question, who am I, in the forefront of our mind. This question doesn't revolve around previous life experiences, has nothing to do with what we've been told our special qualities or unique abilities are, and it isn't related to how worthy or worthless we feel about ourselves. It has to do with a simple truth. As Epictetus, a philosopher in the first century A.D., said, you carry a God about within you poor wretch, and know nothing of it. Just like Epictetus, who was born into slavery, yet became one of our most profound teachers, we came into this world with an inexhaustible supply of talent. Our abilities are as limitless as God's are, because we're a distinct portion of the essence of Him. And there's an infallible way to begin entertaining those abilities and creating as He does. That way is to become aware that anything that excites us is a clue that we have the ability to pursue it. Anything that truly intrigues us is evidence of a divine, albeit latent, talent that's signaling our awareness. Having an interest in something is the clue to a thought that's connected to our calling. That thought is a vibration of energy in this vast universe. If something really appeals to us and we feel excited but perceive ourselves as devoid of the talent we think is necessary, it's probably an even higher vibration. 
Anything that's causing excitement within us is evidence of a spirit message that's saying, you can do this. Yes, you can. If we react to this message with anything other than, you're correct, I can do this, I have the ability to do it, then we've selected the vibration of resistance and ignored the vibration of excitement and interest that spoke to us. Our thoughts about who we are, what excites us, and what we feel called to be and do are all divinely inspired and come with whatever guidance and assistance we'll need to actualize these goals. The decision at this point is, are we willing to listen to these divine thoughts that pique our interest, or do we go on listening to the false self that's made us what Epictetus called a poor wretch? Rather than case studies of which I have only second-hand knowledge, I'm going to use some examples from my own life that illustrate listening to the false self. My background would appear to be an unlikely one for what I'm calling magnificence. Here's what it would look like on paper. Fathered by an alcoholic who abandoned his three children, childhood years spent in foster homes, a classic underachiever educated in public schools, grew up at the low end of the socioeconomic scale, no financial advantages, no examples of or ambitions for higher education, four years as an enlisted man in the United States Navy, admitted to a university on a provisional acceptance at the age of 22 due to lower than average grades in high school, worked his way through three advanced degrees by being a cashier and a stock boy in a grocery store in Detroit. This isn't exactly what you'd call a prescription for becoming the best-selling author of 28 books and a successful public speaker. I couldn't begin to tell you how many teachers of creative writing and speech gave me low grades for my efforts in these fields. All I can say for certain is that I've always had a knowing about my interest in writing, have always been excited by the prospect of entertaining and informing an audience, any audience. By all of the accepted standards, I didn't have any writing ability. What I did have, and still do, was an interest and a passion for writing. It inspired and thrilled me, and I simply loved it. From the perspective of inspiration, I had the ability to do it, and that's all I needed to know. Then as now, I trusted that the universe would handle all of the details, including will I be published, will the critics approve, will my book be a bestseller, will my mother approve, will I get an apology from any of my old English teachers. But really, who cares about any of this? The fact that writing excites me is all I've ever needed to know. When I follow that thought and stay with it, I conclude that I have the ability and the talent, and so do you. Like me, it's easy to find what excites you. What do you find intriguing? Does learning yoga and becoming an instructor interest you? Then you have your answer. The issue isn't about ability, it's about being matched up in spirit with your current thoughts and behaviors. I still remember the excitement I felt at being admitted to a doctoral program, despite the fact that no one in my family had ever entertained such a possibility, and I didn't know one single person who had entered, let alone completed, an advanced degree program. I was excited beyond what I can convey to you here. I knew that whatever I needed in the way of ability and talent would be there. So how about you? Do you live with resistance? Or do you allow your enthusiasm and excitement to be a vibrational match to what intrigues you? Keep in mind that as one of God's glorious thoughts, you've originated out of an energy field that knows only possibility. So stay in vibrational harmony with this idea and know that your thoughts, which emerge as interests, excitement, inner thrills, and illuminating sensations, are indications that you have the necessary ability to merge with your magnificent creativity. You came from magnificence and you are magnificent still. Two, changing the awareness of our magnificent physical presence. In the previous section, we answered the question, who am I in spiritual rather than physical terms? Now let's ask a similar question regarding our physical body. Even though we've been living in it ever since we began as an embryo, it's still relevant to ask, what is this body that emerged from spirit? Our body, your body, is made up of chemicals, Far too many for me to elaborate here, but some of them are iron, magnesium, calcium, nitrogen, hydrogen, and on and on and on goes the list. These chemicals are part of a finite supply here on Earth, so what flows through our veins is part of that finite supply. To that end, the iron that's in our blood was once somewhere else, perhaps in a dinosaur, in the body of Jesus, or in a mountain in Afghanistan. And now, it's in our body. And when we leave our body, our iron supply will reside someplace else on Earth as a part of that finite supply. 
In other words, our entire planet is made up of the exact same chemicals that constitute our physical makeup. Chemically speaking, there's no difference between humans and rocks, trees, orangutans, or distant stars. Grind them all up, and their chemical composition isn't what distinguishes one from the other. Our physical presence is a spiritually directed conglomeration of a hodgepodge of chemicals, and the end result is that we're being made up of the same stuff that makes up the stars. We're made up of stardust, that's right, the stuff of dreams, twinkling, magical, beautiful, light-filled stardust. Remember that the spirit from which we originated can create anything, including worlds, so why would it choose ugly or unattractive creations? We're here in the perfect body for our time here in this incarnation, and it's a living, breathing miracle in every way. It's guided and being directed by an invisible force that directs everything and everyone in the universe. It beats our heart, it digests our food, it circulates our blood, it grows our hair, and repairs our cuts and bruises, all independent of our opinion about it. Living in spirit means that we see our body with all of its unique characteristics and feel thankful for the perfect temple that's temporarily housing our true primary existence. If it's short or tall, bald or hairy, stumpy or slender, extend loving appreciation to it every day. If it can't see or hear, resides in a wheelchair or a hospital bed, has crooked teeth or only three toes, whatever, love this collection of stardust. A prayerful thought might go like this. I think of my body as a piece of the eternal, an individualized expression of God. I live in spirit, inspired, because I'm the same as the loving energy that created me, which is perfect. Think about the logic of what I'm saying here. Obviously, we can't live a life of inspiration if the physical shell we take with us everywhere is perceived as anything other than a divine, perfect creation. Our attitude toward our body, along with how we feed and exercise it, must match up with spirit. We came from love, so we must extend that love and appreciation to our body at all times in order to be genuinely inspired. 3. Changing the Awareness of Our Magnificent Personal History This third and final element of our inspirational magnificence is perhaps our greatest challenge. How can we look upon all that we've done or failed to do and view it through the lens of our magnificence, especially when we've been trained to feel shame and self-reproach as a result of our perceived failures or flaws? We've all reacted to situations in the past in ways that we wouldn't want to today. I personally have done many things that I wouldn't choose to repeat, yet every recovering or recovered addict looks back with gratitude for the experience that brought him or her to a higher, more loving, sober place. As I've said in other places, true nobility is not about being better than someone else. It's about being better than you used to be. Every single experience in my life, right up to this day, was something I needed to go through in order to get to be here now, writing these words. What proof can I offer for this assertion? It happened. That's all the proof I need. As we look back on our life, we failed at nothing. All we've done is produce some results. It's imperative that we send love to those who were hurt by us and forgiveness to ourselves to heal our inner agony. We can then view it all as what we needed to experience in order to get to a higher place. One thing I've learned in my 65 years is that virtually every spiritual advance I've made toward a higher, closer alignment with God energy has been preceded by some kind of a fall from grace. Such mistakes, in quote, mistakes, in quote, allow me to write and speak from a more compassionate stance. That is, they always seem to provide me with the energy to propel myself to a higher place, truly, I bless all of these failures, in quotes, because I know I needed to go there in order to get here. Be gentle and forgiving with yourself. Abandon any and all shame and refuse to engage in any self-repudiation. Instead, learn from Leo Tolstoy, who said that the most difficult thing, but an essential one, is to love life, to love it even while one suffers, because life is all, life is God, and to love life means to love God. So love life, every moment of it, especially your blunder-filled past. Dr. Abraham Maslow, perhaps the most influential person in my life many years ago, is quoted at the beginning of this chapter as saying, What is necessary to change a person is to change his awareness of himself. Consider how you might want to follow his advice. 
You can never be mediocre because you are magnificent in every way. So seek ways to change your awareness of yourself so that you're fully aware of your magnificence and can become receptive to inspiration, your ultimate calling. Chapter 8. Inspiration is simple. Quote, I have lived long enough to learn how much there is I can really do without. He is nearest to God who needs the fewest things. Socrates. Three keys to keeping life simple. While the theme of this chapter is that inspiration is simple, this doesn't mean that we should sit around doing nothing, waiting spirit's arrival. Instead, it means having faith that our spiritual connection flourishes in a life dedicated to joy, love, and peace. If our daily activities are so overwhelming that we don't make these three things our priority, then we're disregarding the value of living a simple life. Let's now look at each simple key in more detail. Joy. A hectic schedule crammed with non-purposeful activities precludes an experience of inspiration. For example, when we accept obligatory committee assignments or board appointments, requests to write on subjects that don't inspire us, or invitations to gatherings we don't want to attend, we feel joy draining from our body and our spirit. Our life must be open to spirit's guidance in order for us to feel inspired. When the calendar becomes frenzied, full of unnecessary turbulence because we fail to simplify, we won't be able to hear those long-distance calls from our source, and we'll slip into stress, anguish, and even depression. So whatever it takes to feel joy, we simply must act upon it. Regardless of our current station in life, we have a spiritual contract to make joy our constant companion. So we must learn to make a conscious choice to say no to anything that takes us away from an inspired life. This can be done gently, while clearly showing others that this is how we choose to live. We can start by turning down requests that involve actions that don't correspond with our inner knowing about why we're here. Even at work, we can find ways to keep ourselves on an inspirational agenda. For example, during my years as a college professor, I recall being asked over and over to partake in activities that didn't correspond with my own inspiration. So I devised a simple solution. I took on more teaching assignments, and in exchange, my colleagues attended curriculum meetings, served on research committees, and wrote building improvement reports. I consistently listened to my heart, which always demanded joy. Keep in mind that it's only difficult or impossible to accomplish joy when we engage in resistant vibrational thinking. If we know that we don't have to live a life stuffed with non-joyful activities, then we can choose the way of inspiration. Opting for joy involves giving ourselves time for play instead of scheduling a workaholic nightmare. We deserve to feel joy. It's our spiritual calling. By giving ourselves free time to read, to meditate, to exercise, and walk in nature, we're inviting the guidance that's waiting patiently to come calling with inspirational messages. The bottom line here is that we can simplify life by cutting down on the busy work that keeps us off purpose. We must curtail such activities and listen to spirit, staying aware of joy and how simple it is to access. Love. Thoughts or actions that aren't tuned to love will prevent inspiration from getting through to us. We need to remember that we came from a source of pure love. So a simple life means incorporating that love as one of the three mainstays of our material existence. On the fateful day of September 11, 2001, what stuck in my mind were the cell phone calls made by the people on the ill-fated planes. Every single call was made to a loved one to connect back in love or to express final words of love. No one called the office or asked their stockbroker for a final appraisal of their financial status. As relationships that weren't love-based didn't enter the thoughts of those who knew they were leaving this physical world, their top priority was to be certain to close out their lives in love. Tell the kids that I love them. I love you. Give mom and dad my love. Just as love is the priority in the final moments of life, so it must be as we simplify life now. We can go toward a clearer life by examining and purifying our relationships with those we love, with ourselves, and with God. 
What we're looking for are connections that keep us in an energy of love, which is the highest and fastest energy in the universe. Peace. I know that having inner and outer peace is simply crucial for me. I eschew turmoil, conflict, and agitation, and remove myself from these non-inspiring elements at every opportunity. After all, I can't be the spiritual being I desire to be or live in God-realization when I'm engaged in any form of bedlam. Somehow, I've been directed to maintain the peacefulness I crave by having those dormant forces potentially spoke about earlier in this program work for me throughout my career. Many people who have a similar semi-celebrity status as myself are surrounded by a long list of people who orchestrate virtually every aspect of their lives. I, however, have chosen a simpler route, and the universe has responded by sending me a very few individuals who supported my desire for peace. I'd like to spend the rest of this section telling you about each one of them so that you'll have some clear illustrations of how these wonderful people have helped me stay in spirit. Years ago, I realized that I needed help in managing the affairs of my growing enterprise. Yet the idea of agents, business managers, advisors, attorneys, accountants, mediators, bodyguards, personal trainers, and any number of people to represent me seemed beyond my tolerance level. Many of those who do what I do, even on a smaller scale, have a large entourage of personal attendance for all manner of duties and activities. And I've had these contemporaries complain to me about being burdened with all of their representatives and spending more than they take in to support the services of all of these individuals. This is not my way. In fact, I have one person who handles almost all of my requirements. One day, while I was running a training session for a marathon, God sent me the perfect person to handle so many of my upcoming unforeseen pressures and requirements in the form of a woman who'd left high school in a foreign country to come to America with her two daughters. She doesn't have any fancy degrees or specialized skills, but what she does have is a heart as big as the sky, fierce loyalty, and a willingness to do whatever it takes to learn with on-the-job training. Originally from Finland, but now a U.S. citizen, Maya Lebos is the ultimate definition of a multitasker. In three decades, she's never said, I can't do that, it's not my job. She manages every request, answers my mail, books all of my talks and my appearances with the media, takes me to and from airports, maintains my personal privacy by deflecting low-energy requests, and deals with the hundreds of appeals I get for endorsements and writing requests. Yet she also handles innumerable tasks, including grocery shopping, vitamin purchasing, office tidying, or bringing clothes to the cleaners. I can count on her to take care of everything and anything I need. When I met Maya almost 30 years ago, she was completely broke. Today she owns her own own home by the ocean and is my best friend, confidant, and associate. You see, when we're open to matching up our desire for peace and simplicity with the peace and simplicity from which we originated, God sends what we need. In my case, I got an entourage of one to handle what myriad specialists can't do for so many of my contemporaries. Every writer needs an editor. Almost 30 years ago, God saw this and sent one to me in the form of the enormously well-read and competent Joanna Pyle. She's been my one and only editorial person for the 28 books I've written. I don't submit to editorial boards. Joanna does for me what many writers ask for from their team of editors, editorial assistants, line editors, rewriters, revisers, amenders, annotators, and so on. I want to keep it simple, and Joanna knows how I write. She's also the only person who can read my scribbles since I write in longhand. As the computer age dawned on the publishing world, Joanna trained herself to meet these newly emerging technological requirements. She didn't ask me to write on a computer or to change anything. She knows my desire for simplicity and peace, and she accommodates me perfectly. When I finish a chapter, I send it to Joanna with complete trust that she'll edit it in such a manner that it will be consistent with my original intent. She transcribes it, types it, reorganizes it, and computerizes it, all with a smile and genuine gratitude for being able to fulfill her purpose. Joanna is me. I am Joanna. Once I was able to convince her to leave her non-fulfilling employment as a flight attendant and pursue her bliss as an editor full-time, she was finally able to feel the joy and peace that comes from matching up her energy with her desires. She lives inspiration, and she allows me to do the same.
I only employ one individual who handles any and all matters related to the complexities of taxes, particularly where foreign royalties are concerned. I don't use a team of legal experts who charge by the hour or tax consultants who receive as much as what I owe the government. One man, Bob Adelson, knows my desire for peace by keeping it simple, so he organizes everything for me. He works diligently and thoroughly, doing what he loves, and I treasure his presence in my life. In 1976, after Your Erroneous Zones was published, I decided to move from New York to Florida. I knew absolutely no one in my new hometown, yet I needed an investment person whom I could trust to help me with the bonuses I'd received from the success of my first book. Having been a teacher and university professor before this point with no experience in or money for investing, I knew practically nothing about this world. While contemplating how to start an investment portfolio, I pulled into a gas station, filled my tank, and drove away without realizing that my wallet, which contained $800 in cash, had fallen out of the car and was lying next to the pump. Just a few hours later, a man called to tell me that he'd found my wallet, including the cash. I went to meet John Darling, who was my angel sent from God to take care of all of my investments for the next 29 years, and he continues to be one of my very best friends and confidants. When I needed someone I could trust, the universe sent me a stranger who returned my $800, and I've never had a moment of non-peace regarding investments in the past three decades. John has managed it all for me, always keeping in mind how I like things to be simple, risk-free, and uncomplicated, knowing what my ultimate investment objectives were and what I desired for my family. I left a large, prestigious New York publishing firm to work with Hay House, mainly because everything in the Big Apple was becoming way too complex. My former publisher employed wonderful people, but the company was too big. It had too many tentacles, too many unkept promises, and way too many departments that weren't in harmony with each other or with me. I felt that too often I was being told it's not our fault, the fault is over there in finance or over there in marketing or over there in distribution. It was like a twenty-headed monster. I voted once again for tranquility and simplicity, and once again God sent me a gift, this time in the form of the president and CEO of Louise Hayes Publishing Company, Hay House. When I met Reed Tracy, we clicked almost immediately. This man, who's unafraid to roll up his sleeves and unload trucks even though he's in an executive position, promised me personal attention, and he delivered. We talked every day about a publishing company that didn't get so big that it forgot to take care of its authors. Reed promised me no large conglomerates and said, if you have a desire, make it known to me, and I'll act on it. I loved the lack of complications, since I didn't wish to be in a large business labyrinth any longer. Simplify. Simplify simplify. It has been a glorious experience for both Reed, whom I now consider one of my closest friends, and myself. I wanted peace as a writer, and Louise Hay, whom I've long admired, and her fine president, have allowed me to create in peace. As you can see, I've chosen to allow the world of spirit to send me those individuals who have helped rather than hindered me. Without these fine people and their treasured friendship, I wouldn't be able to be here in Maui, playing tennis, doing yoga, walking on the beach. But mostly, I'm able to write from my heart and do it in peaceful ease, knowing that the universe has taken care of all the details in its own divine way. When you desire peace, simplicity, and honesty, and send out a matching vibration to those desires, all I can say is start watching. It's on its way. A man who personified success at the highest intellectual and social levels would hardly seem one to quote on simplifying our life, yet here's what Albert Einstein offers us on this subject. Possessions, outward success, publicity, luxury, to me, these have always been contemptible. I believe that a simple and unassuming manner of life is best for everyone, best both for the body and the mind. Wow, I'd say this is pretty good advice, wouldn't you? Chapter 9. There's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Quote, Neither does anyone, however many wounds he may have received, die unless he has run his allotted term of life. Nor does any man, though he sits quietly by the fireside under his roof, escape the more his fated doom. It's written by a great philosopher and, and playwright named Aeschylus. Inspiration requires faith. After all, returning to spirit while in our physical body is unlikely to be successful if we don't believe that it's possible. 
We may even have to focus on renewing our faith prior to accessing inspiration, since faith allows us to trust and thereby make use of the vast power that's responsible for creating every physical object in the universe. Faith is an internal knowing that the all-creating spirit provides what we need precisely on schedule. This doesn't mean that we don't have a voice in what happens to us. We do. But the voice only becomes activated when we get our ego out of the way and realign with spirit. When our spirit works with the divine spirit, we can participate in creation and truly know the meaning of this chapter's title, There's Nothing More Powerful Than an Idea Whose Time Has Come. There's perfect timing in the universe, and our arrival on earth was a part of that synchronicity. In other words, we were an idea of God's whose time had come. This chapter introduces the concept of perfect timing and how to believe in it, notice it, tune into it, and apply it. Faith banishes all doubt. We know that ego has virtually no control over what happens to us. Our body grows, develops, changes, and declines independent of ego's desires or opinions. We know that eventually we'll shed this garment we've been wearing for a lifetime, not when our ego decides, but when that idea's time has come. Re-listen to the quote by Aeschylus at the beginning of this chapter about our allotted term of life as an example of what I'm referring to. Aeschylus was the most famous playwright and scholar of his era, and he claimed direct divine guidance in his writing. He was also a contemporary of Socrates, Lao Tzu, Zoroaster, Buddha, and Confucius, who all lived during the 5th century B.C. It's intriguing to note how many visionaries were on the planet simultaneously. Basically, he tells us that the shape of life must run its allotted course, and that we're here to do what spirit intends. According to Aeschylus, we'll leave earth and shake off our physical body in concert with spirit's plan for us. Whether we're ready at age 17, 25, or 105, he advises us to trust in our source. I add to this message that at whatever age we hear these words, it's the right time to realize that we're in the process of surrendering to spirit for the remaining portion of our allotment. The question now becomes, can we join with spirit and play a decisive role in what ideas, happenings, events, or people will show up for us? The answer to me is a resounding yes. Recall once again those words of Patanjali that I shared in the opening chapters. When you are inspired, dormant forces, faculties, and talents become alive. You see, we must have faith in a universe that's created and guided by an intelligence greater than our ego, one where there can be no accidents. When an idea's time has come, it can't be stopped, but by raising our vibration to match that of the universal source of being, we can bring about that idea's time. We can raise our level of consciousness from ego and group dominance to what I call visionary consciousness in which we reconnect to the mind of God. We banish all doubt by our knowing, which is a higher level of consciousness than believing. Our vision is God's vision in a manner of speaking. Let me offer you an example of how this visionary consciousness plays out. One of my greatest teachers and a man I now call my friend is Ramdas. He lives from the spiritual faith I'm writing about without doubts or fears. I'd been a long-distance follower and devotee of his for 30 years, always knowing that we'd connect in person. I had this knowing without ever needing to hurry or force what I sensed was a future connection in his and my lifetime. And when that idea's time came, Ramdas moved to Maui, where I'm writing to you and speaking to you right now in this moment. Today I have the great pleasure of being in the service of my teacher, helping him in these advanced years of his life. The following self-explanatory letter that I wrote recently is posted on my website, drwaynedyer.com. I'm including it here to precisely illustrate how what I'm relating in this chapter can unfold. One of the truly great men of our time needs our help. And I write these words to encourage your generosity and support. Back in the 1960s, a Harvard professor named Richard Alpert left behind the hectic world of academia and traveled to India. There he was to meet his spiritual teacher who gave him a new purpose to fulfill along with a new name. He, of course, is Ram Das. His guru told him, love everyone, feed people, and see God everywhere. Ram Das became a person who lived out this mandate, doing what so many of us could only dream. He connected to his spirit and devoted his life to serving others. 
1969, he wrote and published the signature book on spirituality and applied higher awareness, Be Here Now. In keeping with his commitment to love everyone and feed people, he donated all of the royalties and profits to foundations that did just that. With millions of dollars at stake, Ramdas simply chose to live his life as a man of service to God. After years spent in India in pursuit of a higher, more enlightened consciousness for himself and for our troubled world, he returned to the United States to lecture throughout the country. He spoke to packed venues wherever he went, and as always, he donated the proceeds to such causes as would keep him in harmony with his mandate to serve. He co-founded the Seva Foundation www.seva.org, -E and his writing and lecture fees were primary sources for this compassionate and inspired work. To me, Ramdas was and is the finest speaker I have ever heard, period. He was my role model on stage, always gentle and kind, always speaking without notes from his heart, sharing his inspiring stories, and always with great humor. I tell you this from my own heart. I could listen to his lectures for hours and always felt saddened when they would end. He was the voice for applied spirituality. His life was the model. When he was threatened by having his own private sexual preferences exposed in a time when a closet was the only place that was even mildly safe, Ramdas called a press conference and proudly announced his preferences to the world. He paved the way for tolerance and love when no one else would dare to do so. Most of us could only dream of defying the conventional life and living out our inner callings to promote a cause that was bigger than our own lives, to leave the security of a guaranteed career in a country where comfort was ensured, all to live in a foreign land with few conveniences, traveling and meditating for a more peaceful world. It's what St. Francis did in the 13th century and what Ramdas did in our lifetime. When Ramdas's father, who had largely criticized his son's unconventional lifestyle, was close to death, Ramdas devoted himself to 100% service in those final years. He fed his father, he bathed his father, he placed him on and off the toilet until the day he died. Why? Because he felt this was his mandate. He wanted to experience true service on a 24-7 basis and know firsthand the joy that comes from giving one's own life away in the service of others. Always, for over 30 years, Ramdas was in the service of others. In 1997, Ramdas was struck by a semi-paralyzing stroke and became wheelchair-bound. Still, he wrote of his adventure in a powerful book titled Still Here. He continued to travel, although he could no longer walk, and continued to speak to audiences, although he spoke from a slowed-down body. But still, he did it, and he did it to serve others. Now it's our turn. Ramdas's body can no longer endure the rigors of travel. He's come to Maui, where I live and write. I speak with him frequently, and I'm often humbled by the tears in his beautiful 74-year-old eyes as he apologizes for not having prepared for his own elderly health care, for what he now perceives as burdensome to others. He still intends to write and teach. However, without the travel, we can now come to him. Maui is healing. Maui is where Ramdas wishes to stay for now. He is currently living in a home on Maui, which he doesn't own and is in jeopardy of losing. I am asking all of you to help purchase this home and to set up a financial foundation to take care of this man who has raised so much money to ensure the futures of so many others, to live out what Ramdas has practiced with his actions. Please be generous and prompt. No one is more deserving of our love and financial support. In the end, any donations will help ensure that Ramdas and his work will reach another generation or remind a current generation that it is in giving that we receive. If there has ever been a great spirit who lived in our lifetime, literally devoting his life to the highest principles of spirit, it has been Ram Dass. I love this man. He has been my inspiration and the inspiration for millions of us. It is now time to show him how we feel by doing what he has taught all of us to do. Just be here for him now. If you're inclined, please send any donations to Ram Dass, care of Hay House at P.O. Box 5100, Carlsbad, California, 92018. Truly giving is receiving and vice versa. Ramdas lived a life of giving by staying in spirit. I was sent to this man who has meant so much to me. I always had a knowing that I'd be involved in his mission and his life. It was an idea that I held in spirit for several decades, and now its time has come and cannot be stopped. 
if you feel called to help, you can send in any contributions, and I will see that it goes directly to Ramdas. It was Ramdas's total belief in what his spiritual teacher told him to do with his life that allowed this all to unfold. When we banish all doubt in favor of faith, there's nothing more powerful on this planet. You must believe, and then you'll see it unfolding right before your eyes. Spirit's Timing at Work The power of an idea whose time has come is really the power of spirit at work. Equality for all is how God is, for instance, and we seek to be like God. When enough of us, along with one or two at visionary consciousness, begin to contemplate these in-spirit ideas, they can't be stopped. Let's take some time here to note a few such ideas from America's history. When it was time for the unspeakably horrid practice of slavery to be abolished, that was an idea whose time had come. This was because a critical mass of individuals with a new vision for humanity began to contemplate something that had been espoused a few generations earlier. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. It took more than 85 years after Thomas Jefferson wrote these words, but then the idea couldn't be stopped. Even though slaves represented a tiny part of the population and had no voting rights, when a man with visionary consciousness, Abraham Lincoln, along with many others, approached this idea from an inspirational perspective, it was clear that the time had indeed come to end slavery. This new idea of equality for all is the way of spirit. Next, we can see also an idea whose time had come in the granting of voting rights for women in 1920. Despite the opposition of a non-visionary president, Woodrow Wilson, and over the objection of a majority of men who had voting privileges, the idea couldn't be stopped. Several visionary women who aligned with many other men and women believed and made it happen, a right that we take for granted today. Next, the racial integration of the United States is another example of an idea whose time had come. When this concept began to surface in the visionary consciousness of a few people such as John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., Lyndon Johnson, and Rosa Parks, it couldn't be stopped. Despite the objections of millions of people, many of whom were in positions of political power, today, in schools that once practiced segregation, we have a multiracial student body. It's still in the process of manifesting everywhere in our society, but make no mistake about it. This idea cannot be stopped. Next, gay rights is another idea whose time has come. One of the many reasons I admire Ramdas so much is the stand he took a long time ago on equal rights for people of all sexual orientations. No individual or group can be denied legal or social privileges because we all come from one source, which excludes no one. An idea whose time has come is always in perfect alignment with our originating spirit. And finally, the shift in consciousness from a collective belief that smoking in public places is permissible to one where it's not tolerated was an idea whose time had come. The idea became unstoppable when one visionary airline banned smoking on their commercial flights, and then the rest fell into spiritual alignment. When we come from a non-toxic source of well-being, aligning with it is our destiny, and it can't be stopped. I could go on and on with examples of such ideas manifesting in our society. But instead, I propose that we begin looking around us for evidence of ideas whose time has come. You see, when we're ready, willing, and open to it, the divine guidance we seek will spring into action on our behalf. It has been that way throughout our life. We're in a system that's directed by a supreme intelligence, and we're part of that system. Everything is on purpose. Our vibrational matchup determines what we attract and what we repel in our life. We needn't focus on what's already happened and what we've gone through. Rather, we must shift our vibration upward so that it harmonizes with spirit, and then and only then will spiritually-based ideas come knocking on our door. These ideas won't give up or go away because, as we know, there's nothing in this universe more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Our responsibility is simply to become beings who expect and await inspired ideas that will not and cannot be stopped. Truly, there's absolutely nothing in this universe, including ourselves, that isn't perfectly timed. There are no wrongful deaths or mistakes. What shows up is ours, and it showed up precisely on schedule. Before we move on to part three, I'd like you to think about the simple wisdom that the former slave and philosopher Epictetus imparted to us nearly 2,000 years ago. It is my business to manage carefully and dexterously whatever happens. Now there's a powerful idea whose time has come. Thank you.
Part 3. Giving and Receiving Inspiration Chapter 10. Absorbing the Inspiration of Others Quote, A man may have never entered a church or a mosque, nor performed any ceremony, but if he realizes God within himself, and is thereby lifted above the vanities of the world, that man is a holy man, a saint, call him what you will. Unquote. That's from Vivekananda, a great Indian saint. What inspirational people are not? It's possible for someone to achieve at a high level, earn many accolades, be widely admired and respected, but not be living from spirit. Inspirational people aren't necessarily highly motivated in society's sense of the word. After all, such individuals may just be chasing after more symbols of success, satisfying their desire to dominate and control others by acquiring as much power as possible. People who have motivated us are not necessarily inspirational. We may have been motivated by those who threatened or beat us or cursed and called us a fool and a wimp for not doing what they thought we should be doing. Clearly, inspiration wasn't part of their motivation. We also can't assume that all teachers are living their ultimate calling. A good instructor might be very knowledgeable about a given subject and extremely effective at conveying that knowledge to students but he or she might also be very disconnected from God-realization. Teachers often have such low self-esteem that they lose themselves completely in devotion to something that's far removed from their true calling, especially when great teaching skills can fill a void and seem to be a substitute for that calling. Of course, I'm not saying that all teachers are lacking in God-realization, but be wary of assuming that a gifted instructor is automatically living in spirit. A person may have the highest intellectual credentials available and still be detached from his or her spirit. The ability to cite historical sources, speak with distinction, and earn advanced degrees doesn't automatically mean that someone is capable of inspiring others. Once again, it doesn't disqualify that individual either. The smartest people may turn us off with their pomposity and bragging, or they may be so cerebral that it's difficult to know what they're talking about. Be on the lookout for mistaking intellectualization for inspiration. The journey to our ultimate calling isn't a scholastic endeavor. There are no written exams, no grades to earn, no report cards, and no advanced degrees. It's important to understand that any of the traditional measures of success, such as job promotions, wealth, public acclaim, stylishly expensive clothing, a commanding presence, verbal adeptness, of a luminous vocabulary, a charismatic appearance, fame, and so forth, don't necessarily mean high marks as an inspirational person. In fact, some people who rate very high marks on the ego-based indices of success are the ones I find most difficult to be around and totally uninspiring. While fame, in all of its forms, seems highly desirable and is focused upon by endless television shows discussing the personal lives of those who are in the news, particularly show business, this does not measure the ability to inspire in the slightest. When one of my daughters once told me that her goal was to become famous, I urged her to shift her sights to living and acting in rapport with her passion and then letting the fame thing take care of itself. I've met many celebrities in all fields of endeavor, and I can assure you that public notoriety is not in any way an indicator of a person's connection to spirit. And if I happen to be famous personally, it's not because I chose it or even earned it. Fame is located outside of me. It's in the opinions that others have of me. It's my choice to be inspired, however, and that always involves being independent of the opinions of others. Inspirational people aren't interested in winning a popularity contest, especially when those who seek praise and recognition often do so to soothe the feelings of insecurity. In general, people who doubt their divinity fear being criticized because they see themselves as fraudulent beings. Consequently, they take on the full-time job of trying to be liked by everyone they meet. Despite their obvious popularity, they'd be disastrous in the inspiration department. I need to add a disclaimer here. I don't in any way want to imply that a person who has gained great popularity and notoriety is thereby disqualified from being a source of inspiration. Quite the contrary. Many of the most inspiring people I've come across in my life have achieved worldwide acclaim. I simply urge you not to equate inspiration with recognition what inspirational people are. When we meet others who we think might be living in spirit, we must ask the following questions. Do they seem to have a rapturous heart, sending out signals that they love the world and everyone in it? Are they jubilant about the work they do? 
Do they see the world as a friendly place? Are they at peace with themselves? Do they appear to be kind rather than judgmental? Are they confident without being boorish? Do they tend to be cheerful? Do they love to play? Are they elated to be in the company of young children as well as older people? Do they listen rather than lecture? Are they willing to be students as well as teachers? Do they nature? Are they in awe of the world? Do they express rational humility? Are they approachable? Do they take great pleasure in serving others? Do they seem to have tamed their own egos? Do they accept all people as equals? Are they open to new ideas? The answers to these questions will help us ascertain whether another person is potentially an inspiring influence in our life. Those who have the gift of inspiration exude something that's difficult to pin down intellectually, yet is undeniably recognizable in how we feel in their presence. We can sense that they're aligned with the source energy from which we all originate. We perceive a place within them that resonates deeply within ourselves, a vibrational recognition of inspiration. And they have much to offer us. We recognize their high spiritual energy, which longs to be active in our life. When we feel this resonance, it's reflected in a feeling that's similar to a warm, soothing shower that's running deep within us. When I'm in the presence of an inspiring person, the first thing I notice is this warm shower overtaking me. It's like a wave of energy that slowly moves down my shoulders and spine, and I know something is happening energetically. Even though I can't see, touch, smell, or hear it, I know that I'm experiencing a shift that makes me feel incredibly good, or as I like to think of it, incredibly God. My own personal experiences with inspiring people. In this section, I'd like to further illustrate what inspirational people are by noting some individuals who have particularly impacted my life with their high energy. I vividly recall the days of the Cuban Missile Crisis more than 40 years ago. I'd recently been discharged from active duty in the Navy after four years and was attending Wayne State University in Detroit. If the U.S. had been drawn into a war with the USSR, I would have been at the top of the list to be called back to active duty because I had a top-secret job classification. But more than my concern about my own status was what had us collectively biting our fingernails globally, that is, the thought of the consequences of an exchange of nuclear weapons which would put all of civilization at risk. President Kennedy was a source of inspiration to me, but not because of his political views or any of his presidential actions. Rather, I embraced him as a man who conveyed love, peace, and joy in his demeanor and showed respect for all people by vowing to end segregation in America. As Robert McNamara, Kennedy's Secretary of Defense, once observed, if JFK had lived, there would have been no Vietnam War. That's because he believed that war should be an absolute last resort and that his primary job as president was to maintain the peace. I found JFK inspiring back in the early 60s, and I continued to be profoundly touched by his spirits throughout my lifetime. He inspired me. In 1978, I was invited to go to Vienna to participate in a presentation to a group of young presidents of companies. I was assigned to be on a panel with a man who had been a huge source of inspiration to me, Viktor Frankl. Frankl was a medical doctor who had been herded off to die in a Nazi concentration camp in World War II. While imprisoned, he kept notes that ultimately became a book called Man's Search for Meaning. This work, which touched me deeply many years later, illustrated not only how Dr. Frankel survived the horrors of Auschwitz, but also how he helped other campmates to do the same. For example, he taught his fellow human beings how to find meaning and even joy in a fish head floating in the dirty water that masqueraded as soup. He taught them to be with his spirit and infuse it in others who were giving up on life. He even practiced sending love and peace to his captors and refused to feel hatred and vengeance because he knew that it was foreign to his spirit, which he wouldn't forsake. So, 33 years after his liberation, I was about to address hundreds of corporate presidents who were all under the age of 50, as was I at the time. I had read Man's Search for Meaning as a young doctoral student and practiced Frankel's logotherapy which taught therapists in training to help clients find meaning in their existence regardless of their circumstances. Viktor Frankl had been one of the truly inspirational figures in my life, and being on the same panel under the pretext of being a colleague of this master teacher was overwhelming to me. And an afternoon I've never forgotten followed, full of pure exhilaration and inspiration. 
Victor Frankl stayed true to his spiritual origins in the face of horrors that destroyed so many. When I met him, he exuded joy, peace, kindness, and love, and he wasn't bitter. Instead, he felt that his experience taught him lessons he'd never have known otherwise. I spent a good part of that afternoon in Vienna in 1978, listening and being in awe, and now, years later, I'm still greatly impacted by the presence of this man in my life. Yes, indeed, Viktor Frankl inspired me. In 1994, 24-year-old college student Immaculee Ilabagiza came home to be with her family in Rwanda for the Easter holidays and inadvertently found herself in the middle of the, one of the worst genocides in history. As a member of the Tutsi tribe, Immaculee was forced to hide in a tiny bathroom, which was configured in such a way that it appeared to be inaccessible from the house, with seven other women for a total of three terrifying months. As she told me, by the grace of God, we were never found. How that happened, I do not know. All we could hear was the smoke of hatred coming from the men right outside the door. After living in this terror for 90 days, trembling in fear every day, knowing that they would be hacked to death if they were discovered, the women were finally released from their entombment into the protection of French soldiers. As Immaculate related, when we were finally safe, I learned how most of my family had died. My father was shot by soldiers, my mother was killed by machete, and my younger brother was murdered in a stadium while searching for food. My big brother was executed after questioning. They said they wanted to see the brain of a person who had a master's degree, so they cut him to pieces. I met this incredible woman in New York after she was granted an asylum visa as a victim of this organized attempt at ethnic cleansing by a band of thugs. Just about one million men, women, and children were systematically slaughtered with machetes or blunt instruments, and the U.S. didn't intervene, something that former President Clinton publicly acknowledged was the greatest failure of his own administration. Immaculate isn't bitter or filled with rage. She merely wants to be sure that such a tragedy never occurs again. She has love in her heart, and she's committed to telling her story, which is published by Hay House. I was privileged to write the foreword for this amazing book, which is titled Left to Tell, Discovering God Amidst the Rwandan Holocaust. Truly one of the most inspiring books I've ever read in my life. I'm honored to join this divinely inspiring woman by going to Rwanda and helping set up a program to educate and provide for the vast number of orphans who were left behind by this genocide. And yes, being in Immaculate's life in the small way that I am inspires me beyond anything that I can convey here to you in words. In 1999, I was invited to South Africa to lecture to some public audiences. While in Cape Town, I took the ferry over to Robben Island to visit the prison where Nelson Mandela had been incarcerated for so many years. I actually visited at the time of the 10th anniversary celebration of his release. Here was a man who spent more than 27 years of his life in prison. He wasn't even allowed visitors because he was a vocal opponent of a system of apartheid in which an entire race of people were declared by law to be inferior and unworthy of the same privileges as the remaining citizens of the country. And he worked all day in a limestone quarry where the burning sunlight glared so against the white rock that his eyes became mere slits due to the squinting that he was forced to practice in order to survive. I personally spent 30 minutes in that quarry and my eyes stung all day. Imagine what years of such exposure would wreak. Mandela went deep within himself, and when he was finally released, he came out with forgiveness and reconciliation in his heart. His staying in spirit was the force behind the dismantling of apartheid and his ultimate election to the presidency of an emerging democracy of South Africa a few years later. As I meditated in the prison outside of this great man's cell, I felt the warm inner shower I described earlier in this chapter. Then I was handed an autographed copy of his book, Long Walk to Freedom, which I treasure. Nelson Mandela conveyed the spiritual energy of love, peace, kindness, and tolerance during all of his travails, and this spiritual energy provided a blueprint that changed the face of Africa and the world forever. Yes, Mandela inspired me. Closer to home, I was inspired by Mrs. Olive Fletcher in 1956. I was taking biology for the second time at Denby High School in Detroit. I'd failed the class the previous year because of my own stubbornness. I'd refused to complete a leaf collection, which my then 15-year-old self perceived to be an absurd requirement. 
At that time, my mother was divorcing my alcoholic stepfather, and I was working in a local grocery store every evening during the week and all day on Saturday and Sunday. My instructor for this second foray into biology was Mrs. Fletcher, and she was the very first teacher I encountered who seemed to care about me personally. For example, she talked with me after school, called my home to see if I was okay during the tumultuousness, including frequent fights and other unpleasantness, taking place at the time, and allowed me to put my head down and sleep during study periods when I'd completed my assignments. She also encouraged me to tutor other students because she recognized something in me that I'd never heard a teacher say before. She told me that I was brilliant and had a mind that could take me wherever I wanted to go. Thanks to Mrs. Fletcher's inspiration, I went from a failing grade the previous year to an A. I wanted to excel just for her because she had so much faith in me. Now, exactly a half a century later, Mrs. Olive Fletcher still stands out as the one individual in all of my school years who turned the direction of my life from fighting the system to being able to choose to fit in without having to give in. Yes, she inspired me. I could write many more short descriptions of those who provided me with life-altering inspiration, but I'd be remiss if I were to omit the one person among all of those I've known who has been my greatest source of it. Back in 1942, when I was two years old, my mother was left to take on the responsibility for raising my two brothers, ages three and five, and me alone. My father, of whom I have absolutely no recollection, literally walked out on his family and never once placed a phone call to see how we were doing. He paid no child support, since he spent a great deal of time in trouble with the law, including some jail time, for being a thief. He simply walked away and never looked back. After I was born, my mother brought me home to their tiny apartment on the east side of Detroit and discovered that my father had left my 16-month-old brother Dave in the care of my four-year-old brother Jim and had temporarily moved in with a woman in Ann Arbor, some 40 miles away. Try to imagine the scene. It's 1940. A depression has left almost everyone economically bankrupt. There are no government programs to aid the support of three children under the age of four. An alcoholic husband refuses to work, steals money from everyone, and regularly chooses the company of other women, leaving his wife to care for their three babies. An anemic infant needs medical assistance, which is largely unavailable to anyone living in poverty. Yet out of this seemingly hopeless scenario emerged a woman who had a dream that her life could and would get better. After finally going through the divorce, my mother was totally on her own. She worked first as a candy girl at a five-and-dime store and then as a secretary for the Chrysler Corporation, and her earnings came to approximately $17 per week. She was forced to place Dave and me in a series of foster homes supported by the Methodist Church while Jim moved in with her parents. Her nightmare was realized. Her family had been split up, and the thought of this being a permanent condition was too devastating for her to contemplate. But she held a vision for herself that she never, ever abandoned. Somehow, someday, I will unite my family and raise my boys under one roof. Unfortunately, times were challenging and the years passed. Mother visited Dave and me whenever possible. She didn't have an automobile or even a driver's license. And the distance to Mount Clemens, where we resided, was approximately 17 miles. But it might as well have been 7,000 miles since there was no transportation or money to pay for her to get there. But my mother was determined. She even married a man she didn't love as a way to unite her family. In 1949, our family moved into a tiny, and I mean tiny, duplex on the east side of Detroit. Like our father, our new stepfather was also an alcoholic and irresponsible provider. Drinking became his escape, and frequent, hostile interchanges were the norm. But my mother, who refused to see her boy separated again, continued to work, work, and work. Every morning she was up at 5 a.m., making breakfast and packing lunches for her three growing boys. She took three buses to work and three home every day. Standing outside on those endless freezing winter mornings and returning home at 5.45 p.m. in order to prepare an evening meal. My brothers and I all had paper routes or were stock boys, but the hard work fell on the shoulders of this never complaining, always cheerful woman. Every weekend looked like this from my mother washing endless loads of clothes and hanging them up on the line to dry, making breakfast, lunch, and dinner, ironing down in the basement on Sundays. The work never ended, and yet this woman was the most joyful, loving, beautiful soul to be around. All my brothers and my friends came to our house to hang out because of my mother. They loved her, and more than that, they loved being in our home because of the energy she brought to it. 
This woman lived from spirit and offered all of us inspiration. Not one of us would ever have even considered talking back or even being disrespectful in any way. She commanded our respect, but she never demanded it. And with all of the responsibilities she had, my mother never left the house with her hair in curlers or her clothes in disarray. She took great pride in herself, and through her example, she taught my brothers and myself to do the same. While going through a second divorce from a now out-of-control alcoholic, she never abandoned her role as a mother to all of us. In later years, when her own mother was quite sick, I watched in astonished admiration as she took on the sole responsibility for caring for her mom, despite the fact that she had four siblings. And then wonder of wonders, as my ex-stepfather reached a stage where his alcohol and smoking addictions were taking their final toll, I watched in amazement as she cared for this man who had largely mistreated her throughout their marriage. She went to his home, did his laundry, called for medical help, visited him in the hospital, and extended love where she had received only mistreatment and even abuse. Today, my mother approaches the age of 90 and still bowls twice a week, lives on her own, and never complains. To this day, she won't leave home unless she's dressed to her high standards of appropriateness and her hair is beautifully coiffed. She respects herself, and this esteem has trickled down to me, her youngest son, and my two brothers as well. Now she has three boys who are all eligible for Social Security and Medicare, yet still she lives and breathes that loving spirit. Yes, Mother, you inspire me, and I've dedicated this book to you and to Immaculate. Ramakrishna, a great saint who lived in India and inspired millions of others from his God-realized perspective, once offered this observation. Saints, he said, are like big steamships, which not only cross the ocean themselves, but carry many passengers to the other shore. May you too be like those big steamships. But if you're not, then by all means allow yourself to be one of those lucky passengers. Get on board by going on to the next chapter. Chapter 11, Being an Inspiration for Others. Quote, We are all teachers, and what we teach is what we learn, and so we teach it over and over again until we learn. Unquote. That's from A Course in Miracles. And also, quote, The real purpose of teachers, books, and teachings is to lead us back to the kingdom of God within ourselves. Joel Goldsmith. Just as we're all students throughout life, we're all teachers. In fact, we learn best by offering what we desire for ourselves to as many individuals as we can, as frequently as we can. And that's one reason I wrote this book and I'm putting together this program. If I instruct enough people for a long enough period of time, I'll teach what I most want to learn, which is how to live in spirit. Following this line of thinking, it's imperative that we make a deliberate effort to increase our inspirational energy, as this will lead us to being both a spiritual learner and teacher simultaneously. Spiritual teachers have raised the vibrational frequency of their daily life to a point where they're able to provide inspiration to others merely by their presence, and this is the standard to which we need to aspire. It isn't necessarily a scholarly undertaking. There are no lesson plans or report cards for this kind of teaching I'm writing about in these pages and that I'm speaking about here in this program. Rather, I'm talking about the things we can do each and every day to inspire our fellow humans, which is what this chapter is all about. Kindness inspires others. Recently, three of my kids and I were seated at the food court of a mall here on Maui. As we were talking and enjoying our meals, a young boy stumbled and the tray full of hamburgers and french fries he'd just purchased from McDonald's went flying all over the floor. His parents immediately came to his rescue and the manager of the restaurant good-naturedly replaced all of the food at no cost. The boy was embarrassed, but it all worked out fine, except that people were having to dodge what he'd dropped as they lined up for their purchases. Neither the boy's family nor the people working at the restaurant took any initiative to clean up this mess, which was actually a hazard to the crowd at the food court. I watched for a few moments, and then I took an empty tray and proceeded to pick up all of the food and dispose of it in the trash container. I returned to my seat, saying nothing about the incident. 
About ten minutes later, a woman who'd observed the scene without my noticing came over to our table. To my teenage daughters, she said, you girls have just been given a lesson by your father. He has shown you by his actions what it means to be a caring, helpful citizen. No one else in this entire place thought of doing anything about that mess on the floor, but he did. He inspired me, and I hope that you were inspired by his actions, too. Unquote. She left, and my girls sort of smiled knowingly, since this is rather a normal thing for them to see. The point of this story is to illustrate that one simple act of kindness and service that's in alignment with our source will do more to inspire others than lectures on the virtues of being a thoughtful citizen ever could. All I wanted to do was to eliminate the potential peril of greasy burgers and fries on the floor. I wasn't trying to inspire anyone, and that's the crux of this chapter. When we elevate our consciousness above the level of ego, which says, I didn't spill that food, so it's not my job to clean it up, to the level that asks, how may I serve? We become an inadvertent source of inspiration to anyone who's in the energy field of our spiritually based actions. We can also be on the lookout for opportunities to be a source of inspiration. For example, when I board an airplane, I tend to look for the chance to extend some sort of service to strangers. I put the word strangers in quotations in the book to emphasize there aren't actually any strangers anywhere in the universe. Helping vertically challenged passengers place their carry-on luggage in the overhead compartment is perfect because others noticing this kind of kindness may be inspired while at the same time I'm heeding my own calling to be both inspired and inspiring. Gratitude inspires others. Without exception, I begin every day of my life with an expression of gratitude. As I look in the mirror to begin my daily ritual of shaving, I say, Thank you, God, for life, for my body, for my family and loved ones, for this day, and for the opportunity to be of service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If we practice gratitude as opposed to maintaining an attitude of entitlement, we'll automatically extend inspiration wherever we go. Being grateful helps remove the influence of our ego, which is certain that we're better than everybody else. An attitude of gratitude allows us to adopt what's called radical humility, a trait that's very persuasive in helping others feel inspired. Most of the people I've met or observed who are at the top levels in their chosen fields have these attitudes of gratitude and radical humility. After all, when so many high achievers reach for their statuette or championship trophy, they often say, first, I'd like to thank God. It's almost as if they can't help themselves. They're so grateful for their accolade, but even more than that, they know that there's a force in the universe way bigger than they are that allows them to act or sing or write or compete or design. And if we adopt this kind of an attitude, we'll inspire others. It's that simple. Generosity inspires others. It doesn't matter if we call it God, Krishna, Atman, Allah, the universal mind, Ra, Yahweh, or even... Anna or Fred, I think we'd all agree that the all-creating source of everything is the most generous being there is. Along with life itself, it offers us unending abundance in the form of air, water, lungs, heart, kidney, liver, and all we need to sustain life. On just this one tiny planet hurling through space, whatever name we want to call it, it provides the ability to feed all of us and dispose of all of our waste, which then gets used to fertilize new life and then repeats the process over and over and over again. And remember, this is only one planet in an endless universe of heavenly bodies. Talk about benevolence. Generosity is obviously one of the ways to be more godlike. I know that I'm inspired when I see evidence of it on the part of others. Very often it's manifested during or following times of crisis, almost as if God gets our attention and reminds us to be more like Him when we face devastating circumstances. A tsunami diverts our aircraft carriers away from killing each other and into a zone where food and shelter are offered. An earthquake motivates us to risk our own lives to save strangers who days before were called enemies. And hurricanes bring out the best in us. Such so-called disasters lead us to the inherent godlike generosity that's latent within all of us. However, we don't need a crisis to remind ourselves to give. We only need to be in spirit to be reminded of the joy of donating our energy, time, and possessions to others. Listening inspires others. As ironic as it may sound, we're far more inspiring to others when we're willing to listen than when we're giving them advice. That's because conveying to others that we value what they have to say is a way of demonstrating that we care. 
It's a way of being inspiring, a way of listening like God. People who find it difficult to listen to another person without bringing the conversation back to themselves are convinced by their ego of their self-importance. And as you're well aware by now, that ego is an illusion that's convinced us to pay attention to a false self. There's no higher compliment than to be told we're a good listener. Everyone loves a good listener, largely because it makes them feel loved, cared for, and worthy of being heard. When we leave any encounter where we feel we've been heard, even if we know the listener strongly disagreed with us, we're still inspired. Why? Because for a few moments the listener has emulated what it feels like when we pray. In deep prayer, we're not looking for the resolution of conflict or answers falling from the sky. We just want to feel as if we're in contact with someone who cares enough to hear us out. This brings to mind something Mahatma Gandhi, one of the truly inspirational beings of our time, once said, Silence of the sewn-up lips is no silence. One may achieve the same result by chopping off one's tongue, but that would not be silence. He is truly silent who, having the capacity to speak, utters no idle word. In addition, these words from Ralph Waldo Emerson have always reminded me to be a listener. I like the silent church before the service begins better than the preaching, he said. This is great advice if we wish to be a source of inspiration. Being at peace inspires others. Being at peace with ourselves is a way of going through life eschewing conflict and confrontation. When we're in a state of tranquility, we actually send out a vibration of energy that impacts all living creatures, including plants, animals, and all people, even babies. And, of course, the reverse applies as well. Belligerent individuals who live in turmoil and revel in hostile encounters send out nonverbal energy that adversely impacts those around them. The immediate impulse is to remove ourselves from these low-energy, non-peaceful people because sticking around means tension and a lowering of our own energy. Moreover, we become a counterforce to what we're experiencing, meaning that we become angry at their anger and arrogant toward their arrogance. Practicing a peaceful approach to our life on Earth is a way of returning to where we came from. At the same time, it's a powerful source of inspiration to all living creatures. Living passionately inspires others. Did you know that the word enthusiasm originated from the Greek language signifying the God within us? By definition, then, living our passion is the way to convey to others how to be in spirit. Being excited about life is infectious. It rubs off on others and is wonderfully inspiring. I'm reminded of a recent whale-watching trip I took where I observed a young woman I know named Beth as she spoke to a group of people about humpback whales. Her enthusiasm was palpable to the entire group aboard the boat, and the more passion she displayed, the more she seemed to inspire her audience. I've been aboard other boats and seen the impact of guides who merely go through the motions. People in this low-energy environment don't leave the experience feeling inspired. Beth, on the other hand, feels a passion that she conveys to others every single day during the whale mating season. Every day. You see, she studied marine biology in college and has always been fascinated by hunkback whales and their amazing ability to travel between Alaska and Hawaii, to go six months without eating, to give birth in warm waters, and then navigate to cold waters on the return. For Beth, these whales are a part of God's mysterious, miraculous creation. She's living her passion, and she inspires others by her enthusiastic way of being. In fact, everyone in this vicinity knows that expeditions with Beth are almost a guarantee that you'll not only get to see the whales, but that they'll dance and breach and even swim under the boat for you. It's as if the whales themselves are inspired by Beth's excitement. When we're enthusiastically living our passion, whatever it may be, we transmit spiritual signals to those around us that we're in spirit, loving who we are, what we came here to be, and whoever comes into our field of vision. And finally, truth inspires others. Perhaps most urgently, we need to live and breathe truth because nothing inspires other people more than being in its energy field. Years ago, I wrote an article called Who Do You Trust? in which I explained that the trust issue rests on who we seek out when we want truth. Are we drawn to those who will tell us what we want to hear or those who are unafraid to be honest with us, even if it might be unpleasant or difficult for us to hear? The answer is obvious. We prefer to hear the truth. Honesty is a necessity if we're ever to live in harmony with spirit and become a source of inspiration for others as well. When we shade the truth, a part of our brain registers this incongruity. It shows up as a disconnect from God, and we're out of balance. 
Our body reacts by becoming weaker in the face of any falsehood, including our attachment to the false self known as the ego. As we practice living and speaking from our truth, without being hurtful or arrogant in any way, we reconnect with the energy we emanated from in the first place. So let's remember truth as a means for inspiring each other. We must be unafraid to live and speak our truth. Think how inspiring we'd all be for each other if honesty was a prominent feature of our interactions. By demonstrating 100% commitment to truth, with no exceptions, we send out a signal that we're in accord with our source and will do more to inspire others to live and breathe from their own truth than a thousand readings of the Ten Commandments or any other written document. Truth and God are one. We don't have to preach it, only live it. By doing so, we'll radiate it to everyone we come into contact with. As an ancient Hindu saying reminds us, the name of God is truth. Chapter 12 Transcending Commonplace Uninspiring Energy Quote For all our insight obstinate habits do not disappear until replaced by other habits. No amount of confession and no amount of explaining can make the crooked plant grow straight. It must be trained upon the trellis by the gardener's art. That was Carl Jung. And another quote from William Wordsworth. Habits rule the unreflecting herd. Thanks to the world we live in, we've developed many habits that are the direct result of living almost exclusively in ego rather than in spirit. This chapter will stress how to gain awareness of these ego habits, how to immediately protect ourselves from these onslaughts, and how to develop alternate strategies to ensure that we remain connected to spirit, even in the face of a blitzkrieg that's designed to take us away from living an inspired life. I'm not suggesting that there's a conspiracy to keep us from living in spirit. My contention is simply that when a majority of society members are raised and persuaded to believe in the illusion of ego, then that society will develop and evolve firmly committed to that false self. It would then be natural for such a society to put forth messages designed to promote the idea of the importance of ego and all of its inherent ideas, and we're fully immersed in such a society right now. Ego's Warriors Let's take a look at some of the habits that rule the herd, in the words of William Wordsworth. Following are several omnipresent, lacking in inspiration entities that join up with ego to bombard us daily and that we need to become aware of. The Media A century or so ago, long before the media became such an active force in our lives, the news was almost exclusively received from one's village. Bad news was rare and tended to only involve accidents or natural disasters such as fire, flood, drought, or the occasional crime perpetrated by someone in the community. For the most part, one's daily life was consumed by work and family interaction. Any kind of news was essentially information about the village and was primarily communicated by word of mouth. Today, however, it's a very different picture. We've created a society that sends out specially trained people to scour the globe for depressing bulletins that are delivered to us wherever we are. The news is now available at home, at work, in our car, at the gym, on airplanes, standing in line at the bank, in the hospital, and on portable devices wherever we go. We're now able to directly tune in to the reports of those organizations who search for information designed to make us feel bad, that is, removed from spirit, which is all about feeling good or feeling God. We're constantly subjected to this army of bad news collectors who gather and disseminate low vibrational energy for our consumption. Keeping in mind that being inspired is about feeling good and returning to our source of love, it's imperative to become aware of what we're allowing into our consciousness. These bad news assemblers are on a mission to convince us of the inherent evil in the world. They can't possibly believe that we live in a friendly universe, and they seem determined to convince us that their illusion is the truth. The defense against the media blitz of uninspiring energies is to remind ourselves that we want to feel good, in the sense that good and God are synonymous. We can't feel bad enough to change any of the bad news we're exposed to, nor can we eliminate hatred in the world by feeling hateful. We can't do anything positive or loving by joining those who've elected to live in these energies or even those who broadcast it to us nonstop. However, 
by feeling good, that is, by feeling God, we have an opportunity to be a small force that can transcend and convert lower energies into spiritual ones. The world of advertising. Everywhere we turn, we're a target of someone wanting to sell us something. There are advertisements on buses, in the backseat of cabs, at the movies, on telephone poles, on our cell phones. After every click of our computers, on the radio and television for more than a third of the airtime, in more than 50% of magazine pages, in most cases anyway, while we're on hold on the telephone and even in restrooms, it's difficult to escape this assault on our senses and our spirit as well. Behind this huge blitz that's aimed at us during every waking moment of our lives is the idea that we need to purchase something in order to be fixed or to be complete. Madison Avenue just keeps telling us that we'll overcome our deficiencies and be happier and more fulfilled if we simply buy whatever it is they're selling. The essential message behind this juggernaut is that we need more in order to be happy. Coincidentally, the mantra of the ego is just that, more, more, more. What I'm suggesting is that we can be free from the push to convince us that we need more, while still being able to enjoy the material aspects of the world. In other words, we know that we don't need more, and at the same time, we're free to live happily and enjoy our world the way it is. I want this distinction to be clear because it's fun enjoying a new automobile, or well-made clothes, or dinner in a nice restaurant, an expensive piece of jewelry, or, or anything else that might be advertised, including this program. What we want to avoid is the inner belief that somehow our true essence is lacking if we don't get the things we're being encouraged to buy. We must also guard against allowing the stuff to define our worthiness, which is what advertisers are frequently attempting to convey. Entertainment. As we progress toward a more inspired life, we'll begin to notice that the activities we've called entertainment have actually been leading us away from being in spirit. Since everything that we allow into our life represents an energy that impacts us both physically and spiritually, it's imperative to raise our awareness level and defend against the habits that deter us from being in spirit. It's vital that we're conscious of the following big four, which are really low-level energies masquerading as entertainment and are obstacles to anyone's ultimate calling to inspiration. 1. Violence. On average, Children in America see 12,000 simulated murders in their own home on commercial and cable television before their 14th birthday. And virtually all movies made to appeal to a younger audience have grim killings, explosions, and chase scenes built into the storyline, which seems to consist of guns, 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 and kill, kill, kill. The more gruesomely, the better. These decidedly uninspiring messages continually bombard all of us when we're supposedly experiencing uplifting entertainment, but we can do something about it. If enough of us decide that this is not going to be on our daily menu, then the manufacturers of this kind of recreational material would bring it all to a halt. For example, if more of us were aware of the content of the video games that our kids play, many of which simulate rape, torture, and even murder, we wouldn't permit them in our homes. Yet there are alternatives available to us. First on this list is screening our entertainment options for violence and making a commitment to choose only those pastimes that are free of any energy that doesn't match our desire to be in spirit or inspired. Our Creator creates out of love, kindness, and peace. So if we clear opposite energies out of our life, we'll almost immediately feel inspiration returning to our life. What follows is one of the most poignantly inspiring letters I've ever read, written by my dear friend Ramdas to the parents of a young girl who'd been brutally murdered. Even in such horrific circumstances, Ramdas was able to provide inspiration. I reproduced this moving letter with Ramdas's permission in order to help you see how it's possible to transcend violence with inspiring spiritual energy. Dear Steve and Anita, Rachel finished her work on Earth and left the stage in a manner that leaves those of us left behind with a cry of agony in our heart as the fragile thread of our faith is dealt with so violently. Is anyone strong enough to stay conscious through such teachings as you are receiving? Probably very few. And even they would only have a whisper of equanimity and peace amidst the screaming trumpets of their rage, grief, horror, and desolation. I can't assuage your pain with any words, nor should I. For your pain is Rachel's legacy to you. Not that she or I would inflict such pain by choice, but there it is. And it must burn its purifying way to completion. 
For something in you dies when you bear the unbearable, and it is only in that dark night of the soul that you are prepared to see as God sees and to love as God loves. Now is the time to let your grief find expression, no false strength. Now is the time to sit quietly and speak to Rachel and thank her for being with you for these few years and encourage her to go on with whatever her work is, knowing that you will grow in compassion and wisdom from this experience. In my heart, I know that you and she will meet again and again and recognize the many ways in which you have known each other. And when you meet, you will know in a flash what now it is not given to you to know, why this had to be the way it was. Our rational minds can never understand what has happened, but our hearts, if we keep them open to God, will find their own intuitive way. Rachel came through you to do her work on earth, which includes her manner of death. Now her soul is free, and the love that you can share with her is invulnerable to the winds of changing time and space. In that deep love, include me in love. Ramdas. I can't imagine a more inspirational letter being written at such a time of such difficulty. Typical of my dear friend Ramdas. 2. Hatred. Much of our entertainment dollar is spent watching malice, hatred, and hostility in some form. Now, in my opinion, there's far too much animosity in our world, so I have no desire to sit through a movie or listen to a song that repeatedly describes how one group hates another. Martin Luther King, Jr., one of my personal heroes, said that the only way to convert a perceived enemy into a friend is by love. Since we know that hatred itself breeds more of the same, then being exposed to it, even when it's dressed up as entertainment, is something to be cognizant of when we choose a film, a television show, a sporting event, a play, or a book. Any hateful message is non-spiritual energy that we're exposing ourselves to, and the more we consciously allow, the more we'll be inclined to attract it into our own lives. The moral of all of this is that entertainment can be uplifting and edifying, or it can be demoralizing and debasing. So where do we want our energy to flow? And even more important, what kind of energy do we want our children to experience? We must be on guard against any entertainment that uses excessive profanity and seems to support hatred and disrespect in its narrative. I love this story that the Dalai Lama told in a documentary titled The Yogis of Tibet, who witnessed the carnage and decimation of the entire Tibetan culture by the Chinese, beginning with the Communist Revolution of Mao Tse in 1949, related a story in which he stated several times, I was in great danger. This was surprising since these yogis cared very little about their own safety. When the enlightened yogi was asked about his perceived danger, he responded, Yes, yes, I was in grave danger. That is, I was in danger of losing my compassion for the Chinese. This is not only a beautiful story, but it also helps us remember to be careful about accepting hatred as normal in our entertainment activities, for they can put us in the same kind of danger that the enlightened yogi recognized. And even more personally significant, enjoying hatred as entertainment can keep us from reconnecting to our spirit. 3. Fear. Our universe is created out of love, kindness, peace, and well-being. So when we're an energetic match to this awareness and refuse to live in fear, we'll attract the protection and guidance we desire. We can absolutely affirm that we won't attract anything that's harmful to us or to our loved ones. We can heighten our awareness that we're never alone, and we can have faith that whatever we need to experience is on its way and God won't send us anything we're incapable of handling. We can also be aware that the word fear is an acronym for false evidence appearing real. That one phrase can help us remember that the ego is the false self and identifying with it leads us to believe the false evidence. Even now, after reading all of this, some readers may continue to make fear real with thoughts such as, he wouldn't be able to say these things if he knew all that I've been through. But in my heart, I know that this is a universe that's on purpose and supported by a creator who is good. I never doubt it. And not only do I refuse to live in fear, but I also refuse to attract to myself the vibrational, energetic equivalent of those fear-based thoughts. As an old German proverb proclaims, fear makes the wolf bigger than he is. And finally, four, sarcasm. 
Just about every situation comedy on television has a familiar focus, dialogue that's dedicated to sarcastic, unflattering comments between the supposedly comedic characters. Put-downs are the very bread and butter of almost all primetime shows today, so in essence, we're asking to be amused by children being smart alecks toward their parents and siblings, mouthing off to each other with as many disparaging comments as possible. Oh yes, and these nasty rejoinders are followed by a laugh track to really drive home that we're being, quote, entertained, unquote. Sarcasm designed to inspire laughter sends a message to viewers that's anything but inspirational. Remember, our ultimate calling is always about being in harmony with our source of being. We're all here as the result of a creator who has great respect for all of his creations. Since no one is inferior in our creator's eyes, no one deserves to be ridiculed for the purpose of gaining an artificial laugh, not in life or on television. When a comment is made in jest and there's a kind of clever banter taking place, that's comedy at its best. But when hostility and disrespect are uttered in almost every verbal exchange with the express purpose to discredit and mock another person, that's a decidedly uninspiring signal being sent to the audience. Awareness and choice are ours to exercise. So if this tendency toward sarcasm has become a habit, we must begin exploring alternatives to this kind of entertainment and family interaction. You may recall that I wrote earlier in this book about my mother. Well, I simply cannot even imagine using her as the butt of a joke to demean or ridicule her. And yet I see this kind of disrespect taking place in nearly every episode of every situation comedy on the air today. Being courteous to others is a matchup to the energy of spirit. Having fun, telling jokes, and being playful with others are all part of being in spirit. But a hostile, sarcastic sense of humor is an energy that moves us away from spirit and into the realm of hurt and dishonor. On every radio, CD player, and television set, there's a wonderfully inspiring little button that says on and off, and it's your choice to befriend it. You can literally push it anytime you wish, or you can use an inner off button whenever you're bombarded by anyone or anything whose purpose is to distract you from your ultimate calling to inspiration. Don't be afraid to use the off button. It works. Chapter 13. Inspiration in Action. Quote, In our era, the road to holiness necessarily passes through the world of action. Dag Hammarskjöld. And quote, Knowing is not enough. We must apply. Willing is not enough. We must do. Johann Wolfgang van Goethe. When we feel inspired, we're on the road to holiness that Dag Hammarskjöld refers to. Yet that road can only be paved with actions that mirror the intention of our originating spirit, actions that we're capable of choosing consciously if we're aware of the duality of giving and receiving. Like two sides of the same coin, giving and receiving are inseparable. Other examples of our duality abound. Before we can take a breath, we must give a breath. In order to give anything away, we must first have been willing to receive it. And our ability to feed others is linked to being able to accept food ourselves. Who has ever seen a person with a front but no back? How about an inside without an outside? Or a magnet with a north pole but no south pole? So just as the prayer of St. Francis reminds us that it is in giving that we receive, in order to receive inspiration we must be willing to give it away and vice versa. I'd like to present some examples of my own deliberate efforts to put the duality of inspiration in action into practice. I work at this every single day of my life. Every human encounter represents a moment of truth for me, one in which I choose to be reconnected to spirit and offer to others what I genuinely want for myself. The opportunities present themselves in the form of a smile or a greeting or an extension of kindness, even if it's just a silent blessing to a person begging on a street corner or a prayer said quietly to myself when I hear a siren. The siren is a reminder to me to offer my thoughts of comfort to whomever is in need of assistance. These are habits that I've developed over a lifetime. Then there are the days when I go out on a premeditated odyssey of inspiration without any fanfare or need for recognition. Here's the result of one such inspiration excursion. And keep in mind, this all happened in one afternoon. I reside on West Maui, 
while I'm writing, and on this particular day, I decided to make the 20-mile trek to Costco to load up with supplies for two weeks of uninterrupted writing. As usual, someone was standing by the roadside looking for a lift to the other side. This is a commonplace occurrence here on Maui, and it's my regular practice to pick up whoever's seeking a ride, usually a young person with a surfboard or a couple with luggage needing transportation to the airport. I always view giving rides as an opportunity to serve another person, and I get to feel good as well. If you're thinking about how dangerous this practice might be, I simply don't ever entertain such thoughts, and I never attract people or events into my life that cause me harm. It's just not my way of being in the world. On this day, I picked up a 41-year-old man from Canada named Raven. Maui tends to attract people with names like that, who needed to get to the airport. As we talked, it turned out that my passenger hadn't spoken to his father in 17 years, disting himself out of respect for his mother and sister, who had their own unresolved conflicts with this man. Raven admitted that he felt distressed and incomplete. Moreover, he found himself repeating some of the behavioral patterns of his father that had caused this family's rift in the first place. I brought up the subject of forgiveness, mentioning this quote from A Course in Miracles. Quote, Certain it is that all distress does not appear to be but unforgiveness. Unquote. I related the story of my experience at my own father's grave in 1974 and how that one single act of forgiveness turned my life around and headed me back in the direction of spirit. As I dropped Raven off at the airport, he hugged me. With tears in his eyes, he said, I can't believe how much this one trip has changed my life. I feel that you were sent here by God to remove this sword that's been hanging over my head. And I know what I have to do, and I will do it, and I'll do it soon. It was a moment of inspiration for both of us. It would have been just as easy for me to maintain silence on that 20-mile ride along the ocean, but I knew that on this day I was on a pilgrimage of inspiration, and Raven was one of my co-conspirators. I headed back to Costco for one of my favorite activities. I love the opportunity to purchase large amounts of goodies of all descriptions in the store's open warehouse atmosphere among lots of local people doing the same thing. At the back of the store on this day, a gentleman who recognized me from my PBS appearances approached me and wanted an appointment to discuss a problem he was having. I informed him that I was writing a book, so a scheduled meeting would be impossible. But knowing that some force had brought us together in the midst of all this delightful chaos, I asked, what's the problem? The man told me that he was a diabetic who developed a fail-safe method for delivering insulin in a manner that would leave no one out. So, what's the problem, I once again ask. Why not implement your plan? He went on to explain how he'd been unable to get the necessary government agencies to meet with him. Various layers of bureaucracy were impeding his progress. On and on he went with a litany of obstacles that he felt were being placed before him, until I finally stopped him. I sense that you know exactly what's needed since you're a diabetic too, I said, and you know exactly what needs to be done to implement your idea. He lit up like a Christmas tree, giving me a knowing smile, and he said, Exactly, but I can't. I stopped him cold, reminding him that when we focus on what we don't want, then that's what we'll get. We get what we think about, whether we want it or not. I then asked him to consider staying out of the system of obstacles altogether. He should go ahead with his plan, forget about what couldn't be done, and just do it without the assistance or resistance of anyone else. If your plan is viable, then they'll ultimately come along, I reminded him. Just do it and stop trying to get the approval of a bureaucracy. And then I asked, you know what to do and how to do it, don't you? Yes, I do, he replied, and I will. I feel as if this little meeting was arranged by God just for me today. After getting my second hug from a stranger in the past 30 minutes, the man pushed his shopping cart away with a newfound sense of inspiration. He'd returned to spirit, where the idea of anything being impossible is impossible, and I'd been able to extend some spirit offerings to another. Continuing on my way back to West Maui, I picked up a young fellow named Andy, who was on his way to the Hard Rock Cafe, fancying himself a Rastafarian rap artist. Andy had long dreadlocks and a strong inclination toward using marijuana as a stimulus for his music. As it turned out, he simply wanted to approach the manager at the Hard Rock to see if he could perform there on weekends. He was out of funds and without a plan. Even his upcoming spontaneous audition had been purely a fantasy, since he hadn't contacted anyone at the restaurant for an appointment. As we talked, I told him a story that my daughter Summer had recently related to me. She has a little dog named Joey that she takes with her every day as she trains horses and gives riding lessons. Her friend Mimi had told her that Joey was a perfect example of being at peace with God, and my daughter agreed. Joey's mantra is, breathe in, breathe out, 
Life is good, she said. That's all Joey does all day, every day. Breathe in, breathe out. Life is good. Andy loved this story, so I asked him to give me a song using this theme as the primary lyric. My car was suddenly filled with the sounds of a Rastafarian rapper pounding out a fast-paced lyric. It was sensational, and Andy was in heaven. By the time I dropped him off at the restaurant, he had his audition all planned, and he'd written his very first song. Breathe in, breathe out, life is good. I handed Andy a $50 bill, which inspired him to cry out in appreciation, and off I drove. It was a double dose of inspiration. Andy was aligned with spirit by being a creator of his own music and feeling purposeful and confident, and I was experiencing heaven on earth for being able to extend love and assistance to another person. And it was my third such gift in the past two hours. Next, I proceeded to a grocery store to pick up a few items in smaller quantities than were available at Costco. As I stood in the checkout line, I struck up a conversation with the woman behind me on the subject of raspberries. I was purchasing two half pints of these precious little jewels to put on my morning bowl of cereal, and the lady asked about the price, which I hadn't noticed. She went on and on about how much she loved raspberries, but their cost was so outrageous she'd never spend that kind of money, even for something she loved so much. I responded by telling her about my happy memories of growing up in Michigan and picking berries as a young boy. To this day, raspberries are one of my favorite foods, and I buy them whenever they're available. The woman could relate to my memories since she grew up in Pennsylvania and used to pick the berries herself, coming home with red stains on her fingers and all around her mouth. At the register, we saw that the baskets of berries came to $7.99 each. My new friend almost collapsed, but told me to savor each and every one of those little treasures. As I walked away, I reached into my bag, and I placed one of the containers in her hands and told her to enjoy them as a gift from me. This lady, who was counting out her change to pay for a single container of yogurt, was stunned. I finally convinced her that if she wouldn't accept them as a gift from me, she'd be depriving me of my own treat in knowing how much pleasure she was going to have relishing and savoring these little gems. My new friend was obviously inspired by this unexpected expression of kindness to a stranger. I could see the gratitude and love in her eyes as she tucked the berries in her straw bag. I, of course, was right on track, enjoying my fourth occurrence of inspiration and action on the same afternoon, and much to my surprise, number five was evolving right in front of my eyes. In almost every aisle of the grocery store, I'd seen the same woman, dressed in flowery slacks and a bright orange blouse. As I approached the bakery to buy a loaf of olive bread for my daughter Serena's arrival the following day, she loves this bread, the woman in the colorful outfit talked to me about a multi-grain bread that she absolutely loved. It's the best I've ever tasted, she said in a heavy foreign accent. As I approached the cashier, there she was again ahead of me, asking if I'd hold her place while she picked up some items she'd forgotten. Then in the parking lot, she stopped her car to allow me to enter the exit ramp. Finally, as I was driving home, I spotted her again. Her car was sitting by the side of a putting green with the door open and the engine running, and she and a man were hitting golf balls on the green. To me, this was more than a series of accidental encounters, so I decided to turn my car around and deliver a present to her. I pulled up behind the automobile and approached with an autographed copy of The Power of Intention in my hand. It turned out that this lady was originally from Poland and was on her honeymoon. She introduced me to her husband, and I gave them the surprise wedding present for which they were most grateful. I have no idea what took place in their lives after I drove off. I can't tell you why she kept appearing over and over and over again, or if the book I gave them made any kind of a difference in their lives. All I can say for certain is that these newlyweds were very touched by my gesture, and I had my fifth gift of feeling connected to spirit in one afternoon. As you can see, the opportunities to reach into the lives of others in an inspiring way arise in countless ways every single day. We can either act on these momentary impulses and feel inspired, or we can ignore them and stay in our ego-dominated world. I choose to act, for it makes me feel creatively alive, connected to God, and to everyone else in the world. Taking action is how we increase our connectedness to spirit. If we're heeding our ultimate calling, we must be willing to act on that mission. We may believe that inspiration is something that arrives in some mysterious way that's beyond our control. Or perhaps we're waiting for God to send us motivational signs. But it's clearly best to rely exclusively on our decision to act in ways that will intensify our awareness of spirit. Try this action plan for a few weeks and see if you don't feel more inspired than you've ever felt before.
Part 4. Conversing with Your Spiritual Source Chapter 14. Your spiritual source can only be what it is. I cannot imagine a God who rewards and punishes the objects of His creation, whose purposes are modeled after our own, a God, in short, who but is a reflection of human frailty. Albert Einstein And from Emanuel Swedenborg, we are because God is. Five Characteristics of God Let's now examine the elements that most of us agree define the essence of our Creator, along with how they can help us sensibly approach Him. 1. God is love. We came from love, and we desire to return to that heaven while still on earth. I repeat Emerson's appropriate observation that love is our highest word and the synonym for God. In other words, if we dwell in love, we dwell in God. If God is love and cannot be anything other than what God is, and we wish to have a dialogue with God, then it seems to me that we come to our source in love or we're wasting our time. God cannot and will not respond to unloving requests. No matter what our religion, whatever we want to discourse with our source of being, we must do so without malice or hatred in our heart. In this way, we'll shift our vibrational energy to a frequency that harmonizes with the highest vibration in the universe, which, of course, is that of spirit. As St. Francis instructs us so simply, where there is hatred, let us sow love. Love and forgiveness will then activate the dormant forces I talked about in the opening parts of this program. That is, the right people and the events will materialize synchronistically. This is because we're in spirit, remembering that God simply can't help if we expect him to hear anything other than love and forgiveness. As Martin Luther King Jr. once said, we must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. This seems to say it all. So in the private, quiet, prayerful moments of asking for God's help, don't ask him to help defeat others in any way. Rather, pray, dear God. Make me an instrument of thy love. I want to be like you. I have forgiven them, and I have forgiven myself. And remember that there can be no forgiveness without love. And without love, there can be no way of being heard by our source. 2. God is peace. One of the most quoted verses in the Old Testament, which may also be my favorite biblical offering, is this. Be still and know that I am God. So a corollary of this might then be, be agitated and turbulent, and you will never know God. Along with praying or communing with our source, with peace in our heart, we must be still. This means taking time to get quiet before meditating, and also monitoring our breathing. As we exhale, we can train ourselves to let go of all of our non-peaceful thoughts, and as we inhale, we can breathe in spirit. We can also ask St. Francis to guide us. He had very little peace in his lifetime, but when he prayed, he knew what his source was like. St. Francis wanted to be in spirit. So rather than asking God to deliver him some peace so that he could escape the disorder and the chaos he saw all around him, he requested, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. In other words, St. Francis knew that God was peace. So in his prayer, he asked to be returned to a state where he'd be like his creator. We can keep reminding ourselves that all of the non-peace that's in the world is not of God. It's of ego. Then we can ask to be helped back to his peace. This approach will attract the assistance we're requesting. It's all about matching up the vibrational energy of our desire for peace with thoughts and behaviors that are consistently peaceful with those desires. 3. God is all-inclusive. We won't be heard by or receive assistance from our source if we're touting our separateness from our fellow humans. You see, when we seek special individual favors from God, or even when we seek to converse with our source from this perspective, we're once again living an illusion. If God were to acknowledge our belief in separation, perfect oneness wouldn't and couldn't exist. 
it's impossible for a source that creates everyone and therefore is in everyone to even have a dialogue with someone who's harboring ideas of their specialness or separation from everyone else. In conversing with our source, as always, we strive to be more like it. So we need to see ourselves as connected to everyone in the universe as we enter into prayer. Then we can ask for guidance and assistance in summoning the all-inclusive spirit. Make me an instrument of you. Allow me to see you in everyone I encounter. Help me to see myself in others and to extend first to them what I aspire to myself. I've noticed that this is how you are, and I wish to be just like you. This is the kind of dialogue that activates the dormant forces I've spoken about. The key is getting past your ego-based idea of separation and instead seeing yourself as a part of the oneness of all. As Thomas Aquinas put it so succinctly, true peace consists in not separating ourselves from the will of God. 4. God is abundance. As St. Paul once said, God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance. So why is there so much apparent shortage in the world, including people starving and living in poverty, and millions of folks having the persistent problem of too much month left at the end of the money? Well, what I can say for certain is that God is not to blame. There's more than enough to go around. After all, we came from a place that knows nothing of deprivation, and we arrived on a planet that has the capacity to grow the food and slake the thirst of every one of its inhabitants many times over. As a species, we human beings have brought the ideas of deficiency and depletions of God's gifts on ourselves, largely by taking very ungodlike actions. God serves all of us, but our greed has made us forget others and focus only on ourselves. As a people and as individuals, we've brought lack to our lives, and we can only fix this deficiency by becoming more like our always-serving, endlessly abundant spiritual source. The answers to the resolution of poverty and scarcity are readily available to us, and they'd be resolved tomorrow if we remembered that we're all one on this planet. We all share the same origins, and we all end up back in the same non-place where we began. When we return to spirit in our heart, our governments will align with this truth, and our leaders will emerge from in-spirit consciousness. We need to pray for the elimination of a perceived shortage and approach God in the style of St. Francis with words that go something like, Make me an instrument of thy endless abundance, rather than asking God to fulfill something that's missing. In this way, we can summon his energy back to us, rather than staying focused on what we don't have. If we focus our thoughts on lack, we'll only attract more of the same. And five, God is well-being. Spirit never has a fever and knows nothing of illness. So in my humble opinion, it makes no sense to pray or engage in a discourse with God from a perspective of asking to be healed, unless, that is, we have a firm understanding of what we mean by the word heal. If we mean to overcome an illness or infirmity, then I feel that we're again violating the truism that nothing can be what it isn't, including God. As Ernest Holmes once wrote, the will of God is always good which means to me that disease, sickness, and suffering are not part of God's energy. On the other hand, if we use the word heal to mean reconnecting to our source of well-being, then we're open to the potential of receiving assistance to overcome any infirmity. And that's how I use the word. I never ask God to help me to get over a feeling of sickness. Even when I had a minor heart attack five years ago, I asked to be made an instrument of God's well-being. I acknowledged that my body had taken on non-well-being, be it from my lifestyle, diet, and habits, or the toxins I breathe in and out, whatever. It was not of God. It was of me in this physical world, and I prayed to be reunited to a stream of well-being. I knew that I was a piece of God, and it was just as easy for him to heal a cut on my finger as it was to restore my heart to a healthy state. Since I knew that God's healing power was within me, I just needed to help my body remember this. Similarly, in a time of recent disharmony in my life, I found myself feeling sick to my stomach and unable to sleep until I remembered that this experience was a gift to me. As I conversed with my higher power, I asked for guidance and visualized myself as a magnet attracting plentiful well-being, and in this way healing was virtually immediate. Before we go on to the next chapter, let's look back to the observation made by Emanuel Swedenborg. We are because God is and add, not because of what God isn't.
Chapter 15 Your Spiritual Source Knows Quote, It is true that divine will prevails at all times and under all circumstances. There is no need to tell God your requirements. He knows them himself and will look after them. Ramana Maharshi And from Ernest Holmes The thing we surrender to becomes our power. As the parent of eight children, it goes without saying that I've witnessed many occasions when a two-year-old made a request that couldn't be accommodated. Often the request became a standoff with the toddler crying, insisting, and even throwing a tantrum. But since I was the adult, I'd stand firm and refuse to grant the child's wishes. Running around the block unsupervised, racing through the house with a sucker sticking out of his or her mouth, playing with electrical sockets, climbing up the stairs alone, and putting his or her finger in a younger sibling's eyes were some of the behaviors forbidden by me, the parent, who simply knew better. If we put ourselves in the place of toddlers and give our Creator the very same leeway that we as parents took with our children, the purpose of this metaphor becomes perfectly clear. Just as it's absurd for a two-year-old to insist on having his or her way, our creative spirit doesn't need to be reminded of what to do for us or how to go about doing it. It already knows. In fact, there's a wonderfully enlightening quote in the Bhagavad Gita that says, Only the fool, whose mind is deluded by egotism, considers himself to be the doer. When we're about to enter into a discourse with our Creator, it's crucial to approach with the understanding that we aren't the doer. It may sound a bit extreme, but this is how Immanuel Kant described our situation. God is our owner. We are his property. His providence works for our good. Please don't take the word owner as an insult. It's only the ego that's offended by this concept. In other words, we needn't presume to tell our source what needs to be done to provide us with a happy, fulfilling life. Instead, it's our job to change our thinking so that it's vibrating to a frequency that matches God's energy. And this begins by understanding that it's impossible for God to forget anything. Unlike human parents, God is omnipotent, so it's unnecessary to remind him of our needs. Trusting and Surrendering Returning to the analogy at the beginning of this chapter, most children are free-spirited little beings who don't think about questioning their parents' judgment. After all, most mothers and fathers know what's in their offspring's best interest, including what's required for successful survival. These senior partners look out for their kids' needs and direct their early life activities, and they do this as long as is necessary, which is usually until their children begin to develop the ability to trust their own instincts and apply what they've learned. As adults, we can look back on our earliest days with a strong sense of appreciation. We learn not to play in traffic, to avoid eating poisonous foods, to get enough rest each day, and so on. Today, we feel thankful and appreciative that our parents were there to guide us toward the responsible, self-contained people we are today. We can appreciate that they did what was best for us, and they never forgot us. I trust that the analogy is clear. Our relationship with God, our all-knowing, never-forgetting senior partner, is just like our childhood relationship with our parents. Just as we did with our mothers and fathers, we're now choosing to trust in the wisdom of our Creator. In other words, we don't need to be told by virtual parents what's best for us. We don't have to rely on so-called religious superiors to keep us in line because we're no longer needed little infants. We now trust our source because we've matured to a point where doubt has been supplanted by faith. Somewhere between childhood and maturity, we surrendered and trusted our parents just as we're now surrendering and trusting the all-knowing, loving source of creation. Co-creating with Spirit Keep in mind that we can't co-create with anyone, including our spiritual source, unless we're in a place of harmony. To that end, we must suspend our false self, the ego, and stop all thoughts of resistance before we can participate in creating the inspired life we desire, in perfect symmetry with spirit. Whatever we ask of our source in our prayerful communion will no longer be a wish or a hope. It will become a reality in our mind, just as it is in the mind of God. The how and when of its arrival, which have always troubled ego, are no longer issues. We maintain our optimism and thoughts such as, I desire it, it's in harmony with my source, or it's on its way, there's nothing to fuss about, and then we can relax and surrender to our knowing. Again, as Ernest Holmes reminds us, the thing we surrender to becomes our power. I know that the term surrender is generally associated with defeat, but there's no victor or victim when surrendering to God. This isn't about winning or losing. You see, 
what we're doing here is giving up our false self in favor of returning to our authentic self. And when we do, we'll meet our spiritual creator and become empowered to live in the same vibration with it. We'll become co-creators by surrendering and joining the all-knowing, all-creating force that allows everything to come into existence. Then our knowing replaces our doubts, and divine will prevails at all times. Only now, we're in harmony with that divine will. Chapter 16. It's all about remembering. Quote from A Course in Miracles. The memory of God comes to the quiet mind. It cannot come where there is conflict. For a mind at war against itself remembers not eternal gentleness. What you remember is a part of you. For you must be as God created you. Let all this madness be undone for you and turn in peace to the remembrance of God, still shining in your quiet mind. Everything we've ever experienced is still stored as an invisible memory, and we can access it if we choose. For example, when my grandmother was close to death and doing what some call involuntary hallucinating, she was pulling out all kinds of facts from her earliest days. Street addresses, the names of neighbors, locations of family outings, relationships with friends of her own mother, who were only there in my grandmother's infancy, all of it was somehow available to her. It turned out that in some mysterious way, Grandma was tapping into memories that everyone else thought couldn't possibly be recalled because she was only a baby at the time. I have no idea how she did this. All I know for certain is that we reach into our own personal history and bring to the present thoughts that impact our state of mind as well as our level of inspiration. You see, the mere recollection of something in the past that we call a memory is capable of affecting us either positively or negatively in the present moment. Therefore, they're extremely powerful tools for our current state of mind. Obviously, there are some negative memories lurking around somewhere in the nethermost regions of our mind. But why access them if they're going to cause us to feel uninspired? What I'm trying to make clear here is that we've got to figure out how to return to where we came from in order to commune with our spiritual creator. Therefore, being inspired itself is going to require us to go back and do some major remembering. Remembering your spirit. At the beginning of this chapter, there's a powerful quotation from A Course in Miracles that I feel sums up all we need to know to facilitate going all the way back, that is, prior to our baby days, our birth, and even our conception. It's about remembering our origination. I committed this passage to memory many years ago, and I use it as a way to remember who I truly am and where I really came from, particularly when I communicate with my Creator to stay on purpose and in spirit. Now I'd like to go through each of the messages in this observation from A Course in Miracles one by one. Number one, the memory of God comes to the quiet mind. We came from a quiet, peaceful place. That's the very essence of creation. So when our mind is filled with noisy dialogue, we shut out the possibility of remembering our spirit. Incessant chatter keeps us attached to the physical world and produces anxiety, stress, fear, worry, and so many of the emotional reactions that are decidedly removed from God realization. We must minimize distractions when we wish to communicate with God. So being in nature, away from the artificial noises that invade our space, is helpful. But the most important thing to consider is how to keep our mind free from the dizzying, bewildering cascade of thoughts flowing through our head from morning till night, and even on into our dream state. It's been estimated that we have something like 60,000 separate thoughts every day. The real problem is that we have the same 60,000 thoughts today that we had yesterday. I've made the practice of meditation a part of my daily life because it's one way to quiet the mind so that the memory of God is accessible. So by learning to meditate, or at the very least shutting down the inner dialogue produced, directed, and acted upon by your ego, you can open up a space for remembering and returning to spirit. 2. It cannot come where there is conflict. In order for conflict to exist, there must be two opposing forces at work. That is, one force in the form of an idea, a point of view, a desire, or a contribution, directly clashes with another. 
Conflict defines our lives in many ways, as we oppose our partners, our children, our bosses, our neighbors, and even our countries. In politics, it's always one party versus the other, and the entertainment industry portrays battling points of view that are usually turned into violent scenes. Essentially, conflict requires two-ness. However, remembering where we came from involves our returning to the oneness of being in spirit. After all, there are no battling powers in the divine realm of spirit. There's only perfect oneness, and this is what we want to rejoin. We want to become one again with our Creator, and we can't retrieve this memory of God with a mind in conflict in any way. 3. For a mind at war against itself remembers not eternal gentleness. The second part of this teaching from A Course in Miracles reinforces that a combative mind cannot remember where it once resided in eternal gentleness. Obviously, you can't wage war and simultaneously focus on peace and gentleness, and it is eternal gentleness that you want to remember and rejoin. It's really quite simple to do this. Just close down the battlefield and surrender. Remove all of the artillery, send the soldiers home, and replace the instruments of war in your mind with thoughts of peace, tranquility, and surrender. Making your mind a place of peace is achieved by your own will, so steadfastly refusing to have thoughts of conflict allows you to activate the glory of remembering your spirit. 4. The fourth part of this quote. What you remember is a part of you. Every memory I have is me. What a glorious feeling it is to know this. We each have the power to retrieve any piece of ourselves that we desire and to experience it right here, right now, in this present moment. The great Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard once observed that life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. In other words, if we can't go back and remember the spiritual bliss that defined us before the beginning, we've really abandoned a part of ourselves. As we move into communion with God, we must know that our inability to remember our spiritual origins is another way of really saying, quote, I'm unable to know myself because I have no recollection or memory of my spirit, unquote. In fact, the corollary of this line from A Course in Miracles that we're processing right now would be, what you don't remember is not a part of you. In other words, if we fail to remember spirit, then obviously it isn't a part of us. And five, for you must be as God created you. As you communicate with your source of being, know that you're awakening a part of yourself that's just like God. In fact, you ought to try to approach communication with God by being as closely aligned to the way that you were created as possible. That is, by becoming a vibrational match to the all-loving Creator. Come to the quiet moments in consultation with God in love, in peace, and without judgment. As the Course in Miracles is saying, you must be as you were created. So why put on a false mask and pretend to be anything or anyone else? In this way, you can open the channel of communication because you finally remembered to be the way you were created. And that's the key to effective prayer. And as Gandhi once said, prayer is not an old woman's idle amusement. Properly understood and applied, it's the most potent instrument of action. And six, let all this madness be undone for you and turn in peace to the remembrance of God still shining in your quiet mind. Let's take the three suggestions in this teaching one at a time. First, a course says, let this madness be undone. The madness here is that of living in a state of conflict. In other words, we must make an attempt to transcend the dichotomies of our life because the division creates so much suffering and keeps us from living an inspired life. I remember a Ramdas lecture in which he said, I firmly come to the conclusion that there are no thems for me anymore. I can't be told who to hate, who to fight, who to subdue. I only see an us in my heart. All those messages to divvy up our world are insane. All our self-centeredness just drives our ego's insatiable appetite for making us special and putting other people down. All our inclinations towards violence, even when it's acceptable, such as supporting war in the name of patriotism or endorsing hatred in the name of doing our duty, are wrong. The Course encourages us to be done with this madness once and for all, both in our minds and in our actions. And second, we're told to turn in peace to the remembrance of God. Once again, we know in our heart that we came from a place of peace. So any discord can't be the result of our Creator's actions. God cannot come to us when we pray from non-peace, so the solution is to return to the remembrance of Him and ask to be made an instrument of His peace. When I find myself out of sorts, I remember. 
and what I remember is to turn to peace right now in prayer. I become peace rather than anguish, and I feel the calmness I long for come over me like a wave of pleasurable relief. We always have the power within us to shift into a peaceful mode, and when we respect someone, we're able to be in peace in their presence by suspending our inclination to be arrogant. For example, I recall watching John McEnroe behave in boorish ways on the tennis court, slamming his racket, hurling profanities at the referees, and generally being in a very non-peaceful state. But he never behaved this way when he played his rival, Bjorn Borg. Amazingly, McEnroe was almost always able to control his outbursts of negativity whenever he played this cool, easygoing, non-violent, brilliant tennis player. Because he respected Borg so much, McEnroe came to his presence in peace. Finally, the Course reminds us that this peaceful remembrance is still shining in our quiet mind. Notice the words still and quiet. Regardless of where we are in life, if we're breathing, we're connected to our source of being, even though the connection might have gotten a bit corroded. We still have the remembrance of God shining inside of us. It can't be otherwise. Our job is to access those memories, and it will help if we keep them in our quiet mind. This remembrance doesn't shine in our ego mind, our noisy mind, in our self-important mind. Rather, it shines in a quiet, non-violent, peaceful, loving mind. When we go to the quietness, that shining is a luminous reminder of how to approach our creative spirit by remembering. You don't have to learn a single new thing in order to communicate and make conscious contact with your source. It's all in you already. All you have to do is remember. Chapter 17, The Language of Spirit Quote from Satya Sai Baba When asked where God is, people point towards the sky or some far and distant region. No wonder, then, that he does not manifest himself. Realize that he is in you, with you, behind you, and all around you, and he can be seen and felt everywhere. Unquote. In the previous three chapters, I've tried to stress that it's our job to take responsibility for opening the channel to communication to God, rather than viewing Him as a cosmic bellboy whose job it is to listen to our whims and respond just because we ask. But how can we recognize when our spiritual source is getting in touch with us? As Jesus said in one of my favorite quotes, which I've shared thousands of times in my life, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Matthew 19, 26. I'd like you to listen to the ideas I'm offering here concerning the language of spirit with this quote in mind. As weird as some of the communication patterns I talk about may seem, and as much as your ego may be tempted to dismiss them as mere coincidence and devoid of meaning, remember that, with God, all things are possible. Being ready for the teacher. It's been known for millennia that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Well, our teachers are always there because they're gifts from spirit. And the real question is our readiness to tune in to what they have to teach us. The key word here is readiness. That is, we must be open to all possibilities and trusting in our intuitive hunches. Wondering if something might possibly be a message from God is evidence that we're open to our intuition. Our thoughts are sacred and substantiate our connection to the divine, so they don't need to be corroborated by anyone or anything else. Our Creator is listening and responding in ways that don't necessarily correspond to the laws of the material world. That is, we won't be hearing from a physical source that's aligned with cause and effect, the laws of physics, or even what we believe is possible. It's our job to do all that we can to vibrationally match to that spiritual energy. We were once perfectly together with our creative force, and now we're being called to come back to it. It's vitally important to be open to the language of alignment. Most of us need to begin the process by recognizing our tendency to discount such messages as mere happenstance. In an infinite universe, with an organized intelligence supporting it at all moments, there can be no such thing as accidents. For the rest of this chapter, I'll be offering some of my own hunches about how the all-knowing creative spirit communicates. Some of these ways fall into the category of inexplicable alignments which means that there's meaning there, but our ego mind, chained as it is to its belief in the material laws it has always lived by, 
refuses to see the hidden meaning that's staring us right in the face. The Four Messages of Alignment For many years I've felt what I considered to be the language of spirit speaking to me in ways that often defy my logical mind. These feelings are more than hunches and even go beyond intuition, and I sincerely believe that they've contributed to my living and inspired life. The following four examples aren't rules or laws that apply to everyone, but if they do work for others, I'll be even more inspired because it's my intention to be in a space where I'm able to give to others all that I know. I also offer these ideas with a constant reminder that when one listens to spirit, all things are possible. And even though I'm offering them in a numbered sequence, they certainly don't conform to any linear arrangement. 1. Alignment of feelings. When I feel good, or God, I'm aligned with spirit. As I tell my children, we must rely on how we feel to determine our state of health, rather than seeking our answers in a medical printout full of numbers. Feeling energized, content, excited, and happy are better indicators of our health and well-being than having our bodily functions assessed by a distant laboratory. A positive, honest response to the question, does this or will this make me feel good, tells us immediately if we're aligned with our creative source or not. 2. Alignments with Nature Everything in nature is in spirit. It isn't spoiled by ego, nor can it ever be. So when nature speaks to us, we should listen intently. When a wild bird touches us, for instance, or a fish brushes by when we're swimming in the ocean or a lake, I believe that it's a direct communication from our source of being. Since these creations of God instinctively keep their distance, when they depart from their DNA patterns to actually contact us physically, I think we should pay attention. So be aware of episodes in nature that arouse spirit and kindle an inner spark of awe and admiration for you. You don't have to discuss it with another being. If it has meaning for you, it's valid. Listen to the winds, the critters, the clouds, the rains, and the oceans. Listen to it all. Indeed, nature has much to teach us, and it will help show the way. All we need to do is align with its perfection and note how it aligns with ours. 3. Alignment with Events Strange occurrences and seemingly inexplicable events may actually be our all-creating source lining up coincidences, in quotes, to teach us and show us the way. The reason we begin to notice all this type of aligned synchronicity is because we've tuned into it. The teachers have always been there, but now we notice them. And our noticing indicates a new level of readiness to listen to our ultimate calling. In fact, these alignments can take some really interesting forms. The same number showing up, for example. We awake precisely at 4.44 morning after morning and then see those numbers appear on the odometer, on the radio, as a checkbook balance, at the deli counter, and as an assigned number for a charity walk, causes us to ask, well, what's going on here? The answer is that the universe is using us to be receptive and pay attention. It's not about playing all fours in a casino or the lottery. It's about knowing that these seemingly accidental repetitions are actually invitations from spirit to join it. When a book literally falls into our lap or is sent to us by several different people, or even when we keep seeing the title and having it referred to us by others over and over, we need to notice, stop our resistance, and surrender. When we end up reading the contents and applying what it offers, we're aligning ourselves and becoming a vibrational match to the same source that's sending us these signals. And four, alignments with people. When people line up with our thoughts and mysteriously connect their physical presence with our private inner meanderings, we should take note. We must tell ourselves, Spirit is aligning my thoughts with events that are happening. I'll stay alert to what I'm being offered here because there may be a reason. That's all. Just be cognizant of what might be happening, and by being open to what may be baffling and perhaps indecipherable, we're likely to discover that we're being guided to learn. A few weeks ago, I was reading through a book I'd written 16 years ago. In it, I mentioned a friend, Erlene Rintz, whom I'd attended school with from fourth grade through high school. I put the book down and went jogging, yet Erlene was still on my mind. I thought, I'm going to call her the next time I'm in Detroit. After all, we're both having our 65th birthdays this year. That very evening, I was scheduled to receive the Martin Luther King Mahatma Gandhi Peace Award from the Unity Church of Maui, which would be attended by approximately a 1,000 people. As I completed my speech and walked to the lobby to sign autographs, I saw the little girl who sat next to me in grade school and who was my first love and who occupied my thoughts throughout my school years. Believe it or not, 
As I was thinking of her more than a half century later, Erlene was thousands of miles from home and hugging me in the lobby of a theater in Lahaina, Maui. It turns out that she was visiting Maui, had seen the award announcement in the newspaper, and had come to the auditorium to surprise me. It was one of those synchronistic alignments of spirit at work. Somehow, at an unconscious level, I was already reconnecting to Erlene without being aware that she was even in the area. Noticing the same folks showing up in different settings, running into people we haven't seen in a while after we've just heard their names mentioned, and repeatedly seeing an individual's name in magazines, on television, or in a local bookstore, are all synchronistic alignments. Spirit is lining up these sequential happenings for a reason. We just need to be open to learning the reason, and it most likely will be revealed. Perhaps it will be a dream or a sudden instant of eureka, or maybe it will become clearer when simply allowed. No matter how the message comes, we'll look back on it with a renewed insight and the benefit of no longer being closed-minded about such possibilities. What I know for certain within my very core is that there's no separation between us and all that we encounter in the universe. One of my favorite poets is William Butler Yeats, and here he perfectly sums up the ideas in this chapter. O oh, chestnut tree, great rooted blossomer, are you the leaf, the blossom, or the bowl? O oh, body swayed to music, O oh, brightening glance, how can we know the dancer from the dance? You are the dancer and the dance, just as God is. In other words, those messages from spirit are you if you feel them, because it's impossible to separate the dance from the dancer, the root from the blossom, and you from God. The only place where separation takes place is in your mind. But since you're now heeding your ultimate calling, you're right on your way to living an inspired life. Part 5 a Personal Look at Inspiration Quote from A Course in Miracles There is a way of living in the world that is not here, although it seems to be. You do not change appearance, though you smile more frequently. Your forehead is serene. Your eyes are quiet. You walk this path as others walk. Nor do you seem to be distinct from them, although you are indeed. Thus can you serve them while you serve yourself. Unquote. Chapter 18 How Life Looks When I'm Inspired Quote, Give me a man who sings at his work, Unquote. from Thomas Carlyle. And from Virgil, they can because they think they can. In this final chapter, I offer my own very personal view on how the world looks when I feel inspired. I'd like to acknowledge right from the outset that I don't live at this level of being in spirit 100% of the time. Like most everyone else, I occasionally have lapses and feel uninspired. Yet these moments have become rarer and rarer. In fact, it's difficult for me to recall a day in the past several years when I felt completely uninspired. What follows is a personal account of how I feel inside and what seems to take place in the world around me when I feel connected to spirit beyond what I can share here in this program. The Story of Jack The same day that I completed Chapter 17 and read it over the telephone to my editor, Joanna Pyle, on Bainbridge Island, Washington, I had the most profoundly mystical experience of being in spirit in all of my 65 years. The photograph on the cover of this program is a recreation of what happened. When I finished up with Joanna, I went for my daily hour-long walk along the beach. But for some reason, I elected to take a slightly different route along a grassy area adjacent to the beach. I was recalling my friend Jack Boland, a unity minister in Detroit, who crossed over about a decade ago. Jack loved monarch butterflies, often telling stories of how he marveled at these paper-thin creatures who migrated thousands of miles in high winds and returned to the same branch on the same tree where they first emerged from their cocoons. Before Jack passed away, I presented him with a beautiful paperweight containing a dead monarch that I had found in perfect condition. When he died, his wife returned it to me, telling me how much Jack loved that gift and how much he admired these amazing creatures who had such mysterious intelligence built into their brains, which are the size of a pinhead. 
Jack always told me to be in a state of gratitude, and he ended every sermon with this message to God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. On three occasions since his death, the monarch butterfly has landed on my body. Since these creatures studiously avoid human contact, each time this has happened, I've thought of Jack and thought, thank you, God, thank you, thank you. Anyway, as I walked, feeling grateful for having completed the second-to-last chapter of the book, a monarch landed on the ground three feet in front of me. I said Jack's magic words to myself, thank you, God, thank you, thank you, and felt deep appreciation for my life and the beauty of the day. The butterfly stayed right there until I approached it. Then it flapped its wings several times and flew away. Thinking of Jack and feeling a little bewildered and immensely thankful, I watched this creature in flight now 40 or 50 yards away. As God is my witness, the butterfly made a U-turn and not only headed in my direction, but landed right smack on my finger. Needless to say, I was shocked, but not totally surprised. I must confess that it seems to me that the more I stay in spirit, the more I experience synchronicity similar to this one. But what followed did border on the incredulous, even for me. This little creature became my constant companion for the next two and a half hours. He sat first on one hand and then moved to my other hand, never even coming close to flying away. He seemed to be trying to communicate with me by moving his wings back and forth and even opening and closing his tiny mouth as if attempting to speak. And as crazy as it may sound, I felt a deep affinity to this precious living being. I sat on the ground and simply stayed with my new fragile friend for 30 or so minutes. Then I called Joanna from my cell phone, and she was also stunned by the synchronicity, insisting that I somehow get a picture of this event. At this point, I decided to return to my home approximately a mile from where I was sitting with my new companion. I returned along the beach walk where the winds were brisk. The butterfly's wings were pushed by these high gusts, but he clung to my finger and even moved to another hand without making any effort to leave. As I walked, I encountered a four-year-old girl with her mother. The girl was sobbing over some perceived tragedy in her young life, and when I showed her my pet butterfly, her expression went from sad to blissful in one split second. She smiled from ear to ear and asked me all about the winged creature on my forefinger. When I got home, I was talking on my cell phone to my friend, Reed Tracy, as I walked upstairs. He laughed with me as I related the bizarre synchronicity at play at this very moment. I said, Reed, it's been 90 minutes, and this little guy has adopted me. Reed also encouraged me to get a photograph of this, since it was obviously in complete harmony with what I was writing. I left my new friend, whom I now call Jack, sitting on the handwritten Chapter 17 on my lanai, and went downstairs. I found Cindy, a young woman who works nearby, and asked her to run to the store and purchase a disposable camera. She did, and I went back to the patio, put my hand next to Jack, and watched him jump right onto my finger. The photo on the cover of this program is a recreation of that magical moment, and it's the exact butterfly as well. It appeared that my butterfly companion had decided that he was now going to live with me forever. After another hour or so of meditating and communing with this little creature of God and pondering this event as the most unprecedented and out-of-the-ordinary spiritual experience or episode I'd ever encountered, I gently placed Jack back on my manuscript while I proceeded to take a long, hot shower. When I returned to the patio, I placed my finger near my winged friend, and as I'd done many times in the previous 150 minutes, but he now seemed like a totally different little critter. He fluttered away, landing on a table, flapped his wings twice, and flew off straight upward toward the heavens. Moments with him were now history, but I still had the photographs, which I treasure. The next morning, I decided to watch one of my favorite films, Brother Sun, Sister Moon, which I hadn't viewed for more than a decade. And sure enough, in the opening scenes of Franco Zeffirelli's interpretation of the life of St. Francis, there he was with a butterfly alighting on his fingers. Inspirational Vibrations When I live my life so as to be open to the language of spirit, I find almost overwhelming rapture overtaking me. For several days after my experience with Jack, people kept telling me that I seemed so peaceful and content, and one woman even suggested that I was walking grace. This episode with my butterfly friend and the communiques from spirit touched me in an unprecedented level. From the perspective of being in spirit, I've seen its hands embrace me and heard it say, You are not alone. You can count on me to guide you. And whatever you do, do not doubt my presence. This makes me feel safe, comforted, and that I'm not alone. I feel good. I feel God because... I'm living in almost perfect harmony with the source of my being, living on purpose and writing from my heart. The reason I feel inspired isn't because the world looks perfect. Rather, it's the other way around. The reason the world looks perfect to me is because I'm in spirit. 
a person who chooses to live an inspired life. I'm able to stay in a state of gratitude from the moment I awake early in the morning right up until I close my eyes while falling asleep. And throughout each day, I'm reminded that staying in spirit is really about staying in vibrational harmony. I don't find it necessary to change anyone or anything that I encounter or read about in my daily life. Each time that I'm tempted to, I catch myself and return to a mindset that calls to me to be more like God, right here and right now. I stay inspired by making an energetic shift within myself. When I do, the world looks completely different, and I move inwardly toward peace and kindness. The energetic shift is merely a way of processing people and events from the insight of being unified with the all-creating source. That is, by eschewing judgment and allowing the world to be as it is, rather than as I think it should be. I stay inspired by encouraging others to live out their destiny and allowing the world to unfold as it will. And I'm much more likely to feel peaceful. In fact, when I'm living my life from this perspective of inspiration, my vibrational energy is more attuned to that of the creative energy of the universe. And I find that my effect on others is far more spiritually aligned. Furthermore, I know within my own being that I'm doing something very powerful to make this world a more spiritually oriented place for us all. You see, when I resonate to anger, shame, hatred, or revenge, I add to these decidedly non-spiritual energies by joining in what I find to be so objectionable. But when I remember to bring non-judgment, love, tolerance, and compassion to these low, ego-dominated energies, I see how different the world looks, and even how different those around me act in the presence of these God-realized energies. I feel optimistic when I'm in spirit, with an inner knowing that nothing can interfere with an idea whose time is coming or has already arrived. I trust that our Creator knows what it's doing and that good triumphs over what ego believes is bad or evil. I sense that we're all moving toward a world that will no longer know the horrors of war or practice our long-established habits of inhumanity toward our brothers and sisters around the globe who may have different cultural views and their own unique physical distinctiveness. By staying in spirit, I'm truly inspired to see the potential for greatness that's in all of us as one people and I turn from anguish to faith that at least I can live from a place of God-realization and practice being a force for good or for God. Staying in vibrational alignment with spirit allows me to be more present in all of my life activities. I find myself less concerned with goals, outcomes, winning, and accumulations, and far more involved in the process of enjoying the activities of my life. Arriving seems to replace striving. And being in a state of flow is far more common than my old, uninspired state of worry and anguish. I remind myself that spirit is only here and now, not yesterday, not tomorrow, only now. By keeping my vibration aligned spiritually, I see the ecstasy in the present. Everything else that once was a source of worry doesn't come up for me, since the outcomes are already handled for me in my own mind. What will be, will be, I remind myself. The world looks so much more peaceful when I approach it this way. And my ego, which once needed to win at all costs, is relegated to a distant seat in a stadium in another galaxy. Choosing Inspiration My experience with Jack, as well as many similar kinds of episodes in my life, taught me that the laws of the material world truly do not apply in the presence of God-realization. And I know that I have the choice to live at this level of inspiration. When I do so, it seems that the world changes. Animals behave differently than their biological genetics would seem to allow. People at a distance seem to hear me telepathically and respond to my highest thoughts. Objects seem to materialize in defiance of what scientists say is possible. And healing takes place in spite of modern medicine saying otherwise. In other words, miracles seem to be ordinary. The world looks like a place where everything is possible, where restrictions and limitations are non-existent and where the power of our Creator seems to roll right up and land at my feet, begging me to hop on board and witness the infinite possibilities it offers. This is how I feel when I align myself to spirit, cocky inside because I know something that so few ever come to realize, but humble and awestruck on the outside at the miraculousness of it all. When I remember to stay in spirit, I've realized that when one thing appears to be going wrong, I can see clearly that ten things are going right. For example, if my cell phone isn't working, I can note that my health is fine, my family is safe, the ocean is calm for swimming, my bank account has a surplus, my electricity is fully functional, and so on, and on, and on it goes. From a perspective of being in spirit, I automatically shift my attention away from what's going wrong and onto what's right. This then becomes my point of attraction, and I attract more of what I'm focused on. 
whereas at an earlier time in my life, I'd attract more of what was going wrong because that was my point of attraction. How sublimely beautiful the world now looks to me from this magnificent place of inspiration. No longer do I stay focused on and attract more of what's going wrong, for I've learned to place my attention on what's right, what's working, and what's aligned with the all-creating spirit. From this place of inspiration, I ask, what if I look deep within myself and found no original sin at all? That is, what if I discovered original innocence instead? What if the same were true for everyone? I know that our creative source is one of good, and I also know that we must be like what we came from. Therefore, everyone, including myself, is a piece of God. We came to this world from innocence and love, not from a place of sin or weakness. When I see Christ's consciousness in everyone, even those with whom I differ greatly, I'm able to feel good, to feel God. When I know that there's no original sin in anyone, I'm able to think like Mother Teresa who told the world, in each person I see the face of Christ in one of his most distressing disguises. When it is goodness that I look for, rather than sin and weakness, that's what I see. I then see goodness in the little old lady driving slowly in front of me, the elderly man fumbling with his change and delaying me at the cashier, the children squealing loudly as I am attempting to concentrate on a book, the teenagers shouting along with their ear-splitting rap music, or the jackhammer operator whose deafening sounds fill the air with chaos. When I am inspired, I see God-realization, disguised as a minor blip, and the world looks fine, happy, and even peaceful. I remind myself of Rumi's sage advice. If you're irritated by every rub, how will you ever be polished? When I feel inspired, I notice how much zest I have for life and everything that I do. I play tennis with exuberance and without fatigue. I write from my heart. I feel good. I feel God. And this inner feeling radiates outward in all of my waking moments. Inspiration means doing what I love and even more significantly, loving what I'm doing. It's my willingness to bring love and passion to the activities of my life rather than looking for love to emerge from those events and activities. It's an attitude, and knowing this, I remember to pick a good one as often as possible. I know that being enthusiastic feels good, and I also know that I have the choice to select these attitudes at any and all times. By staying in spirit, these outlooks on life become second nature to me. By deciding to live an inspired life, I'm choosing to be in balance with a creative force that responds to my in-spirit thoughts. I'm also believing that I live in a friendly universe rather than an evil one, and feeling supported by it in a similar manner, being grateful for all that God sends my way. I'm not surprised when synchronistic events happen in my life. When I have someone on my mind who lives some distance from me, I actually expect that he or she will call me, and it occurs over and over and over. I know that thoughts are energy, and that those harmonizing with spirit will align to activate the creation process. I love watching all this flow so perfectly and being in harmony with the force that's responsible for all of creation. I know deep within me that I can participate in the activities of this force to bring into reality the manifestation of my spiritually aligned desires. Rather than hoping, wishing, and even praying for an outcome, my inner world aligns with the idea that what I desire is feasible and on its way. This kind of inspired knowing frees me from anxiety and worry. I affirm, it's on its way. There's absolutely nothing to fuss about and I leave the time of its arrival into my life in the hands of the all-knowing, always creative spiritual source. I find that I no longer question the creator of the universe because I'm at peace with the timing of everything. I know enough now not to push the river, not to demand that the timetable of my ego be the same as God's. I know that by staying in spirit, I'm actually participating as a co-creator, and that the more I stay in this aligned space, the more it seems to speed up the process. I've noticed that ever since I've become more conscious of staying inspired and all that this implies, the time between what I think and having it actually show up in my physical life has become shorter and shorter. I'm aware that the ultimate in manifestation is a complete absence of any delay between a thought and its physical manifestation. What's been called the gift of loaves and fishes is what true 100% God realization is. That is, think food and it appears. Think well-being for everyone and disease dissolves. While I know that this Christ consciousness is available for all of us, I have many more glimpses of it as I stay more in spirit. Singing my song. The major change that's taken place for me in this manifestation of my inspired desires has been the awareness of my own capacity for activating the creative force to work with me. 
Today, as I live consciously in spirit, I feel as if I'm more and more able to be an activator of this divine synchronistic force and have it work with me rather than to me. I view these mystical moments as holy instants when my ego is suspended and spirit, in conjunction with my own divine desires, has become the teacher. As my sense of inspiration grows within me, I find myself wanting to do more for others and focusing less upon myself. What I desire is realized through the paradoxical means of desiring it for others even more than I want it for myself. By reaching out in this way and deliberately looking for ways to inspire others, I feel closer and closer to spirit, and ironically, I sense that more of what I desire seems to be flowing back to me as a result of this sharing. At this point in my life, I feel that staying in this glorious state of inspiration practically requires me to avoid condemning others. I look at the behavior of others, even those whose actions are anathema to an inspired world, and I send them love. I know deep within me that declaring war on the problems of violence, poverty, cancer, AIDS, and drug addiction isn't the solution. I'm uninterested in increasing these problems with violent, angry, or hateful thoughts or behavior. I know that I can't get sick enough to make one person better, or angry enough to end violence anywhere. I also sense very strongly that by staying in spirit and bringing a higher mental energy to the presence of these lower, ego-based energies, I'm a force for change, one that helps move the world closer to spirit. I anticipate a planet at peace, along with health, abundance, and love in my life, and in the lives of all others. And I know that it's moving in this direction. I know that for every act of apparent evil, there are a million acts of kindness. That's where I place my attention, and that's what I choose to give away. By doing so, for the larger percentage of my days, my reward is a feeling of being in harmony with purpose. I watch the minor birds sing every morning, and I know they're not doing it because they have the answers to all of life's problems. They have a song inside of them that they obviously feel compelled to let come out. I, too, have a song to sing, and by staying in spirit, I'm able to sing it all day, every day. I know that the answer to what should I be doing is to see the word yes on my inner screen. Yes. I am listening. Yes, I am paying attention. And most important, yes, I am willing. I notice that those around me who feel uninspired are unwilling to say yes to the feelings at the core of their being. By doing so, to every hunch, burning desire, and thought that won't go away, I feel the hand of a guiding spirit that's with me simply because I've been willing to say yes. By saying yes to life, I see the world and all of its inhabitants in a completely new way. As a result of being more and more inspired, I see spirit in virtually everyone I meet, and I feel much more connected to everyone as a result of sensing their spirit instead of noticing all of the accumulations of success that they've amassed. I call this seeing with my mind and not my eyes. It now seems that my identity is associated with experiences that are not exclusively of this world, and I love what my mind sees, possibilities and openings for miracles. It looks past the limitations of my eyes, and it knows that we're all one in an infinite world. My mind no longer views death as something to fear. Rather, it lives in an infinite place, and it is able to step back from this corporeal world and be an observer. Adequately conveying how I feel when I'm inspired is probably impossible. What I so sincerely want to share here is that the feeling of being completely in harmony with our source generates miracles everywhere. I have the delicious, spine-tingling sensation of bliss as I observe and interact in this world from the wondrous vista of being inspired. These words from A Course in Miracles ring true for me. All that must be recognized, however, is that birth was not the beginning and death is not the end. This is the knowing that I have from this infinite in-spirit perspective. There are no conflicts. All is as it should be. The things I wish to improve aren't going to be accomplished by fighting but by placing my attention on staying connected to spirit. In 1 Corinthians, St. Paul says, The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. As I live from a place of inspiration, I see that conflict is no longer possible for me, and I understand what Paul was attempting to say to the people of Corinth in that letter. I will not be defeated. I can't. Because for me, there's no they any longer. Is only us. I've turned my mind to spirit. I know that God created me to be like him, and I must be what I came from. This idea, more than any other, inspires me beyond what I can share here in this program. It's my intention to continue to stay inspired and live what my mind knows, rather than only what my eyes see. 
and my mind knows that we're all in a universe that has a creative, organizing intelligence supporting it. I know that it flows through me, and God willing, I'll stay in spirit and assist you to live that life of inspiration that you came here to live. There can be no greater blessing. I send you love, I surround you with light, and I invite you to live with me in spirit. God bless you. Namaste. This has been a Hay House audiobook production. If you would like a free catalog of books and videos offered by Hay House, please call us at 1 800 654 5126 or visit www.hayhouse.com. <laughs>